is really public for which to stand one nation under God, even if all the liberty of the This is a curriculum committee meeting, and our first agenda item is the schedule of pain exporting. Well, that's us. <laughs> the big show. <laughs> right. Um, so we have a presentation, and some of you have seen parts of this, and there are updates to the presentation since maybe you've seen it. Um, when we're done with that presentation, Daryl is going to walk us through the summary of the survey results. I will forward immediately after this meeting tonight that summary, our presentation, and then the comments made in each three, uh, each one of the three surveys, um, the student, the faculty, and the parent survey um, comments. So you'll get all of that. We thought it would be a good idea just to kind of have the same starting place for discussion and um, to kind of to ground us all in the same information. And I guess for me, human nature is if I would have shipped out um, like all the survey results, we'd all be like, we'd be distracted, I think, by reading a lot of the, the comments that are there. And I kind of want us to have discussion here and then we'll be, be happy to share those with you. We're also gonna be sharing those with with faculty and the summary of the survey will also go on our website for anybody in the community or parents to review as well. We want a conversation to start here. So we're gonna start a little bit, this is a little bit of repeat, so we'll probably go a little bit faster um, than we did before, but if you wanna stop and ask questions, um, by all means, please interrupt. So um, just wanting to review the goal here. The goal for us was to, um, explore and consider the strategies or structures that we could put in place to improve student learning um, and to engage in, with stakeholders throughout the process, which I think we've done. So the process so far, since we've started this exploration back in January, we of course put together a committee. The committee met from January through May. We presented two options to faculty members, our current schedule, and the next best, best option was to take a look at the AEB schedule. We agreed to move forward, continuing to explore that AB schedule with a resource period. We've had some ongoing research that's taken place, continued to learn for the spring, summer, and fall. Uh, faculty meetings have been ongoing. We had full staff meetings. We've had small group meetings. We've had individual consultations with lots of different groups. Our teaching and learning team has also continued to learn and discuss. We had some parent presentations throughout the fall, um, including during open house. We had two special presentations. We had an open office day uh, in which parents signed up in 15 minute increments. And uh, that was that was nice. We'd like to talk to more, but we've really enjoyed talking with our parents and students. Um, we had a full day <clears throat> uh, in the uh, lab space for students at South Campus so far uh, could have discussion with us about what they're thinking and what their questions are and what they've heard and what they haven't heard. And we went through a similar presentation with them and answered their questions the best we could. And of course, um, we've uh, completed some of our exploration with a survey out to get a sense for what parents and students and faculty uh, are thinking so far. So the why and challenges um, uh, the why, just I think we can't overstate the why or, or say the why too often. Um, we're after trying to create what 80% of schools across the country have in their schedule, and that is a flex time or a resource period uh, built into our system where there's opportunities for all students and teachers to be available at the same time for support. We'd like to increase our instructional contact minutes with students, increase the depth of learning in our instruction, align our campuses and be one school on one schedule, decrease some stress and anxiety that might be undue uh, as a result of the way our schedules developed and build that one team culture. Some good news is some of the challenges that we presented back in, I don't know, uh, August, July, um, we have some solutions to. And thank goodness for our faculty who continue to engage us uh, with their concerns and with parents who've, and students who've identified the big things that they're concerned about. And that the big one holding us back was really those nine AP classes that have 60 minutes currently daily. If we moved purely, if we were Puritans and moved purely to an AB schedule, um, those nine classes would be the only classes in our schedule that would lose minutes. Part of our October 27th in-service was visit to lots of schools. And what people came back for a little bit of energy was what they noticed about some of those same EP classes where we've given some um, additional minutes now. 
One of the solutions that we have with many, but one that we've researched, we've looked at, we know will work is double blocking those AP, nine AP classes um, throughout, the, throughout the first semester and then moving to an every other day block second semester. It actually creates additional minutes for those nine AP classes. It does work within the schedule. Um, about 400 students take one of those AP classes. 65 in this current schedule take two or more. So the adjustment allows for those students who take two or more to still fit them in the schedule and those that take it along with other course load, it would work. So we were pleased to hear that if that solution is the one that we agree is a good one, we have a solution to that. And those AP classes would not lose those instructional minutes, which high performing students who spoke with us were concerned about, parents were concerned about, faculty were concerned. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Does, does that mean, that since it goes to double block, that those students that are taking the AP are now taking one less other class? They currently, in the current schedule, for those that take more than one of those AP class already take less classes. But yes, it would mean they'd have to make a, a choice. It would be the same loss of opportunities Just that they currently have. Same loss. Be neutral. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't change. This doesn't change the amount of class opportunities. Most of the students that double with those nine, now remember we have 20, yeah. but those nine, the max, the one, there are two students in our entire school who take four. That would be difficult. Yes. That is not normal uh, in terms of, of schedule. Um, so, so keep in mind that might be something, but that's two students where the vast majority 400 would be allowed to be able to take those classes and keep the minutes. So yeah. the good news about that is the more, more it would be almost a thousand more minutes, which they're not asking for, but they would get. Um, and, and again, as we dial into the details a little bit further, if we have other solutions, the Slinger solution to adding time was building the resource period in the middle of the day. Uh, along with a lunch and then an AP additional minutes built into that time period and all those students got additional, could get additional minutes there. There's lots of solutions, but we like the double period. A lot of schools, Grafton was one that double blocked some of those AP classes. And it really sets them up better, maybe even so than, than, um, than currently, because nationally, most schools start before we do, before September 1st. So they have a jump on us. If we double block those in the first semester, they're going to get a hearty dose of minutes. Uh, in that first semester prior to the AP test. So that would really set them up well. Yeah. And if I could just interject that the reason that's important that so many schools start a couple weeks before mm -hmm. us is that nationwide that advanced placement test is taken on the same day. And the so in Wisconsin, when the law says we cannot start school until September 1st or later, we've lost two weeks of AP instructional time for kids that are all taking the test on May 5th or whatever date it happens to be. We want to make sure we're not losing more instructional time. The 80 minute class is requiring a content remodel. I think we're pretty, um, we're learning a lot. And uh, I think the October 27th visit to schools was very eye opening. Um, it, it, people saw a lot of practices. Sometimes they saw practices, what they wouldn't want to do in that 80 minutes. Sometimes they saw some really, um, I think they were energized by some of the uh, approaches that they saw in the, in the different schools that we went to. Um, I'm confident that that is something we can, I'm gonna get into more detail on that later. That is a sticking point. The 80 minutes among our parents, our students, and still some faculty came through loud and clear as you'll see in the survey. They're worried it's too long. And if they are thinking that if the student um, instructional strategies the students will be exposed to are simply just direct instruction, they are correct. It is too long. So we are building in, we want that deeper learning, and that means varied methodology for instruction. That's very active, cognitively engaging uh, our students at a deep level. So we have we have solutions to that, and that's building more active learning strategies into our repertoire. And I'm very confident that our faculty would be able to rock the block. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. The gap day is a concern for some. And the gap day remembers the day in between when you have an every other day block schedule, you have an, you see your teacher every other day. And there's concerns about attendance and there's concerns about um, whether uh, students that that, that that creates a loss of continuity. And we understand that. We do believe a built-in resource period along with the AB day could um, alleviate some of that where students really need the daily support. Um, and we're working through a lot of the, again, the school visits that our teachers went to, they asked about that attendance piece. And sometimes they, they learned a lot about ways that that gets managed. Sometimes it is, it's, a, um, it's something to consider. I have read nationally uh, when traditional, when people moved from a traditional schedule to a block schedule, um, that attendance went up 
um, that, that you know, students will they'll acknowledge it's important that they're not missing a lot of school if they don't have to. Um, so I think that's something to consider. The traffic piece came up a lot, especially with parents, and I get it. Um, our traffic in the morning, if you don't get here before 645, is, um, it's, it's like a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. you got to really be careful. Um, totally get it. We want kids to be safe. We don't want to create an unsafe situation. One of the solutions we've identified, we still do staggered start, um, where students at South Campus have a little bit longer of a resource period in the morning, and students at North Campus could have a shorter resource period that would allow for that stagger traffic, at least in the morning. We do do, I don't think that we do do, we do not think that the traffic situation is as, as significant in the afternoon, but we can continue to look at solutions to that as well. So those have been the big challenges. Of, you'll read the comments and you'll read the, um, uh, the concerns and the questions that come forward and where our parents are in the process right now. And I think this reflects a whole lot of them. Um, including like attention span and uh, able to focus for that long and all of that work. We're taking that all in and looking at all the strategies that'll be uh, important to consider. Do you want to hit initial common misconceptions addressed or do we hit most of them? Um, yeah, so, so the first one, um, it, and it's heavy in our comments still from our families, is that um, there's still a misconception of, about what the schedule is because there are a lot of comments where it shares that um, they uh, disagree with the schedule change because um, they want their students to have the class all year long. You might see that comment or um, or only four classes a semester is not enough. I've seen that comment. So just to clear up, we are not considering the four by four block, which is where a student takes three or four classes in one semester. The entire year's content is covered in that semester. And then as of January, they switch to three or four new classes. Okay, So that's not being considered. We are considering a schedule that allows our students to engage in their classes all year long. We felt that was very important through the committee that we met with of teachers when considering uh, classes like world language and math to make sure that they're uh, exposed to those skills all year long. I think the rest of them we kind of talked yeah, about, right? I, as I reread, especially parent mm -hmm. concerns, the notion that they would take fewer classes came mm -hmm. through fairly often and it just, I don't think is the case. They have the opportunity to still continue to take eight classes, seven classes or seven and a half classes like they currently do. Um, nine periods doesn't mean our students are taking nine classes. So that might just be where that misconception is coming from. They don't take nine. 99% um, of our students can't. I mean, it's really challenging to take nine classes. Um, so that it's just addressing those questions as they come up because students, they aren't losing opportunity. Every day they'll have a resource period, which can also be a study hall, if they continue to take eight classes. Um, most students would have a study hall at least every other day. They want additional time. But a, a better study hall because teachers would be available to them. Or in their study hall currently, only about, what is it, one-sixth of our staff are available to them based on their prep period. So we can hit, I know also in the parent survey, there are a lot of comments about wanting to see achievement data and the hard data. They want to see the hard data. So I'll comment on that more later about why hard data is a challenge. But here's some data from today. So our state report cards were released pub actually publicly yesterday. And Adam did a great job of pulling together among those in the top 20 in the state of Wisconsin based on report card scores, which schools have blocked schedule, which schools have seven period trimester, six uh, period. Again, it's not all about the schedule. We want to be careful not to draw hardened conclusions there. Uh, which um, the other yes, you can see the yes in the second column. I guess I didn't snip that you well. Shoot, that, uh, that's the um, uh, which schools have a resource period attached to their schedule, and where their um, where the report card score landed. Um, Arrowhead is we we fell uh, 0.7 percent uh, from significantly exceeds to exceeds. Um, we, we teeter between significantly exceeds and, and exceeds or we have over the course of the last six or seven years. Um, but at least to me, even though this isn't hard data, this demonstrates um, data doesn't go down with a block. Instruction is the key component to student achievement, right? Effective teachers, effective programs, impactful feeder school programs, wonderful parents who support their students' education. When you look at those uh, communities, you know, you, know, you know what's going on there. So I, um, there's a mix of schedules. So you can't point to schedule as being the thing. 
that impacts student achievement. Can I read a study? And I have a binder of them plus another big folder. Can I read a study that was done somewhere in the country that would say math scores go down in the block? Yep, I can read that study. I can read another study that says math scores increase slightly by switching to the block. There's just too many variables to say for sure that the schedule is the key piece. It's instruction, it's background, it's aptitude. All of those things build in to, I think, um, student achievement data. This is a reflection of student achievement data, ACT Aspire data. So great schools, many of them we went to go visit on October 27th. They were enormously generous with their time. They were very helpful. We saw a lot of great things, a lot of great facilities too, by the way. Um, so we were just, we were really gracious and, and full of gratitude for what they were willing to share with us. And a lot of them are listed on that. On the state report card data that was just released. Quick question for the block. Is it for all these like A B block no. or is it a blend of great question, Daryl? I should be clear about that. Oh, yeah, I should. Um Cedarburg is on A B block, Elmbrook is four by four. Um uh, Mequon Thienesville Homestead is a trimester, kind of like a block, but a different variation. Um, I don't know Cedar Grove's schedule. Pewaukee is an A day, B day block, Kettle Moraine. I believe is an A day B day block. They've switched. <laughs> um, Grafton, Grafton is an A day B day block. I visited Grafton um, and Sligar is an A day B day block. Um, I, Grafton was a school I went to on October 27th. Um, they're in their fifth year of the uh, change to block schedule in the building in of a resource period and they are making strides. And where they sit on this list is a, is a testament to that. So I'm not sure they were right there few years ago. Did you say that was Grafton. 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 It, it, I actually had this as an afterthought. I wish we would have invited you all to come to us on October 27th. Yeah. I was like, yeah. that was a, a missed um, opportunity. But yeah, good. Grafton was, that was a great visit. So not hard data, but I think it helps. What was Grafton? Do you recall where Grafton was prior? <laughs> Yeah, I do because they're a rival uh, of my pre previous school and they were not anywhere near that. Uh, they were in the seventies. Um, I, um, Sue and I were actually just talking about today, Jeff Nelson and Scott Mensa, the superintendent of the principal there have had a, have had a strong vision and lived it. And that's why you see where they're at. And if you talk to either of them, the schedule wasn't the driver of their success, but it helped give them opportunities, access, the ability to do the things that they wanted to do. Okay. Um, they were very yeah. focused on the pillars for the why yeah. and having that resource period and saying, no, mm -hmm. within the school day, our teachers and our students need to be available at the same time. We need to make that happen. They, they were they were relentless on that. The A day B day block for them, because they were more of a traditional schedule, actually allowed them to take one more additional class than they could before. So they wanted to see growth prior. in their electives. Um, so that was a, that was a big a big part of their why. And and for them, as they thought about this five years ago, part of their why was trying to build in that balance for students. Do you guys have the data that is go back on um, the years? We have access yeah, to yeah, that. We yeah, just pulled this yeah, on here today, but today, so yeah. Yeah. Wise Dash will have all that. We definitely can pull that. Data. I'd, I'd like to see that because sure. this is just one. one yeah, it's just one, one year. Yep. One year. Well, that's what I was going to say. Does that chart just include high schools or includes, because I know us being a, Union nine through twelve. This is all those other schools. I think I pulled the high school 12? rating. I believe I pulled the high school rating. So, okay. so yeah, because I did only nine twelves. Gotcha. So. I do find it kind of interesting that there are several schools in there, as, as well as the number one that are in actual periods, but just have a resource period added. Any any thoughts around that? Some I'll jump in because Whitefish Bay. I was at Whitefish Bay for six years. Uh, their class periods are 55 minutes long. So you add an extra 15 minutes compared to our 40 minute periods. And that that just changes the whole ball game. Mm -hmm. Laura, will you comment a little bit about Whitefish Bay's electives and CTE and performance? Do they have similar kinds of uh, They have far fewer elective classes than what Arrowhead has. Um, well, they're half the size. They have maybe 900 students there, and they don't offer as many electives at all. Um, I've had people ask me if 
if you were sending your kids, having worked in both Arrowhead and Whitefish Bay, very high performing, where would you send your kids? And my comment is always Arrowhead. And I loved Whitefish Bay. I thought I'd retire out of there until Arrowhead tapped on my shoulder and I learned about this place. And the reason I would want my kids here is because of all those opportunities. In Whitefish Bay, if you're a really high performing college bound student, great place. But if you're a student who maybe does better with their hands, they have a couple of wood classes. Uh, it's just not as career focused in a broad spectrum as Arrowhead offers uh, for students. Try to, if you go back to when we were investigating the, um, the schedule, I think, and what I believe we've been told is a priority for the families and what I've experienced is that like the depth is important, the depth of knowledge is important, and try to keep that balance with the kind of opportunities that we have. So that's our that's our challenge. That's our sort of design challenge. Design a schedule that keeps those opportunities. They don't want to lose opportunities, and we don't want them to either. And we want to make sure the learning is deep and strong and improving. So that's that's our that's our challenge. So a current schedule, Arrowhead's current schedule ooh, that got cut off there. Um, that says first, second, third, and so forth. Kind of looks like this. Uh, and, and so just, we did this with parents because sometimes they're not always um, dialed into what that schedule looks like. And then student schedule example in the current schedule, like I just took a fresh, but I literally pulled one off of Skyward. So this student has science nine honors block for first and second over, dollars and cents, health, then lunch, geometry, a study hall, Spanish one, English nine, and social studies nine. And we're confident as we talk about the next possible schedule, like that schedule, that student, that's what they selected for this year would, would fit in the schedule for next year. It would be split over two days. Um, one of the things that the kids, when they came in to talk with us about the schedule, acknowledged, and, and kids came in hot. I mean, they like, woo, some of them was like, all right, <laughs> let's go. Uh, and, and when they saw the potential, I'm not saying that'll happen for sure, but when they saw the potential that their academic classes could get split over, split over two days, that was enticing to a lot of the students. It, uh, that won't always happen. And we try to do that balance, but they're like, that would be really nice. Really nice for tests, really nice for balance. So, so that was one, um, one observation that, you know, out of the hundreds of conversations we've had that seemed to stick out with the kids. So this is the switch. Resource, potentially at the beginning of the day, I think we'd, if we're going to move in this direction, we'd have to really dig a little deeper. What I heard from parents, students, and quite frankly, some faculty yet, what does that really look like? How are kids scheduled? We learned a lot on October 27th about the programs that are out there for students to be able to schedule themselves, for students to, for teachers to schedule students into a resource. Where would their home base be? We'd unpack all of that in a lot more detail for parents to see, for students to see, and even our faculty who haven't yet wrapped their head around what that means for them uh, yet. But right now, again, we continue to hold the beginning of the day. I'm not I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's going. Um, is, there, is there a an option or a way to not have a resource period at the person period across the board, not just as, uh, and the reason I ask that is um, putting myself as a high school student, I would be a grammar. Mm -hmm. I would, I would not do my stuff at night. I would think I'm going to get it done in the resource period because it's the first one to yeah. set the stage for the day. Yeah. And then probably. Yeah. And I probably would do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's procrastination as something to consider. There's pros and cons to different times within the day. Um, I, we saw in Brookfield, I believe, the evidence after second block, somewhere in the middle of the morning. Um, at Grafton, we saw at the beginning of the day. Um, I don't think anybody has it in the afternoon anymore. Some people have it opposite people lunch. Yeah, did Slinger have it around lunch? No, they have it in the lunch, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that, would that school. ever be an opportunity? Because I, I agree with you. I think that that makes it, you know, I do see a lot of uh, benefit to having a resource period. I know that many times that my kids have wanted to get a hold of the teacher. And just because my kids have a study hall or something, this period doesn't mean their teacher is off on that period. So I think, I, I think there's a lot of, advantage to having that touch base and that resource period, but I, I think there's also a, a big advantage to having it in the middle of the day where it's kind of locked in, maybe surrounding the lunch, um, so that to, to your point, Tim, that it's not a easy 
scared for it. So, right. Yes. It creates a little less, if we put it in there, we can talk that through. It just creates a little fle less flexibility for how we use the time, that's all. Oh, how well, it, so for example, at Grafton, uh, I keep talking about Grafton, it's not, but, but Cedarburg did the same thing. Yeah. Um, and, and other districts will have like that softer start and they'll say to their um, freshman sophomores, this is time set aside, you have to be here every day, but there might be a day or two where upperclassmen um, with their grade point average and everything on track, they kind of earn that reward to not have to be there for resource period on certain like days. So kind of situation. Um, they built in a Grafton one day a week that instead of MPCT at the end of the day, they do it at the beginning of the day. That also helps with mm -hmm. softer start for, for them. Um, one day a week or something of that nature, like we have Wednesdays now. So it, it would allow for a little bit less flexibility for the use of time as we shape that. But if, if it's better for student learning, uh, procrastination, time management, those would all be things we'd have to dig deeper into thinking. And we want everybody, all the stakeholders involved in shaping that. So to um, Adam's point about flex flexible scheduling options, FSO, where does that, what happens to that? Yeah, I mean, right now students schedule FSO either the beginning of the day or the end of the day. And I, if they then they take less, a lot, one less class. That's how they already do it. So they could still do that. Would it be daily? I think that'd be difficult. Um, because now we're on a block, so it'll probably end up being every other day. I guess I look at the uh, research period and I think it's in the mornings before every class that day. So if you bump into troubles the night before getting your things done, you're not already two classes in where that might be the classes that you're having trouble with. You can go in and get your problem addressed before those classes. Yeah. So if, yeah, so if we, you know, you know, again, we're looking at everything very conceptual. Studying at midnight or one o'clock in the morning constitutes not participating. No, no. So, you know, again, we're looking at things very conceptually right now, and in, in, in a, we'll, like I've said with everything, we'll dig deeper, um, pulling people into the conversation. I mean, we want students to be able to shape this, we want it to be great and useful for everybody. So um, we've used that as a placeholder. We've certainly seen examples where that's the case, but uh, you know, we, our minds can be changed. So with that resource period, I guess I'm one of those I'm still trying to wrap my arms around a little bit too. Um, who would be like overseeing the students that are not necessarily going to that teacher or whatever the case is? Because if all the teachers are available to meet with, is it like a staff, other staff that's overseeing study calls or how does that work, I guess? You want to talk yeah. about your experience? Yeah, uh, yes. So to answer your questions, there's a lot of different ways it goes about. There are other staff who will just house study halls, right? Um, and so that doesn't change much of the structure for a student other than it's a soft start, which we all know for the brain is even better, right? Them coming in and engaging in a, in a software rather than having to engage with instruction, right? That helps them. So yes, you have, you have people who can house study halls. You can have I mean, my experiences are I had teachers who would have 40 students in their room and they would hit every all 40 uh, by the time they were done. Um, an incredible math teacher at Cedarburg who would just invite kids in, knew the kids, uh, had questions leading up to her class that day and would just get to them so that they come in ready to, to Tim's point, ready for her class instead of having questions on last night's work or the two nights ago work where they're feeling like they're behind and trying to learn the next step, right? So you can have that. You can also have teachers who share classes, who do combined classes, who say, hey, can you take some of my kids so that I can work on these five, right? Um, so there's a lot of flexibilities and it does take a little bit to get into a rhythm and to get um, some of those pieces, but you do create large housing areas just to have a study hall. From that study hall then, students, as they're working through their, their assignments can go meet with a teacher too. Um, that's another benefit of the study hall. Um, so if I'm working through my math in the morning, I was never a great math student, um, and I'm struggling, I can go check in with a math teacher or even a different math teacher who teaches that same class. That's also the benefit of this. Is if my math teacher is running a different session, I can check in with other math teachers during that time too. So there's a lot of different structures and nuances to it. There are programs that help organize all that. Um, yeah, I liked when you had said that there was programs mm -hmm. because some of the other parents I've talked to at other schools were like, yeah, my kid has never used a resource for it. Yeah, it was yeah. So as I say, knowing that teachers could assign mm -hmm. at least takes care of some of that ease or fear of like, yes. hey, kids are just not going to use it the way that you said they're talking about it. You can make them kind of go down. Like, I think the opportunity and some of the things that I've noticed about 
some of those programs where teachers can assign students to their resource or students can select it is eventually building that um, responsibility yep. in the student yep. to say like, you've got this opportunity. Parents know your teacher's free and they're there for you. So the, you know, I expect you to be scheduling that or, or however that, that happens. I think that gradual build in responsibility, that's what you need to be able to do as you become an adult. Um, but in the meantime, while you're learning to do that, teachers can assign uh, students say like, you you know, these two days for the, for the foreseeable future, you need to be with me. And I can share with you, uh, my previous district had a, had a gradual release, so seniors did not have to attend on Friday. <clears throat> and I would stand at that door and watch half our seniors walk in still, even though they could have slept in another 40 minutes because their AP teachers run on a session. It's up to you. If you want, if you're interested and you want to be more prepared, come on in. If not, that's on you. And that, um, you know, autonomy of time and, and self responsibility uh, that they learn from that and uh, as they grow throughout the system is pretty fun to watch, to be honest. Not to say that that's the structure we're going to do, but just gives an example of a student who has to kind of figure out their own uh, greatest benefit of a time like that. So how does it work for attendance? You know, what if one student has to go into two teachers? Or yeah. So generally the attendance, like this, you know, efficiency or um, enriching students or flex a sketch, um, some of them will work, not all of them, but some of them will work with our Skyward system and will assist in that process. But in reading some of the comments from teachers in other districts, that's a learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, and for our attendance people too, it's a learning curve, but the, it should be, attendance is taken. It's minutes that count in our instructional minutes. So um, we have to account for students. Uh, so that those programs, those pieces of software help assist with that. Um, in, you know, where, where my kids have gone to high school, at first when they brought resource period back, I think four years ago, it was a pass system. So they had a home base and teachers were running passes to different places. Well, I think that got old fast. And so now they've built in, um, I believe it's efficiency that they're using there. So, and and again, it's just, it's quick. At Grafton, they're using that as well. Um, I stood in the hallway when I got there before resource period because I wanted to see, there was a, you know, a lot of parents, like it seems chaotic. It seems like there'd be a lot of, um, there was zero chaos <laughs> in the hallways. Kids were just pulling up on their phones. Where did they either sign up or where were they assigned? And all their car um, always were carpeted, by the way, too, which made it for really quiet it's really uh, nice. space. It was like like it's so it's quiet here. Nice. <laughs> um, and it was a day where all four grade levels were supposed to be there. And when that bell rang, nobody was in the hallway and everybody was counted. Is the efficiency the one they use at Brookfield Central? I think I so. I to, it's either enriching students or efficiency. Yeah, I talked to somebody that uh, one of the teachers I think I talked to had talked about how it worked there, and it was it sounded pretty slick. Where that you know it was just a interactive uh, app that they could access on their phone, and you know the teacher would obviously if they needed to reach out to somebody that they needed to have the next day, they they'd set that appointment the day yeah. before, and vice versa, yeah. and they would know exactly where to go. You have to set some for was, yeah. You have to set some parameters with it. So you have to say by a certain time, you've got to schedule it, it again, where my kids go to school by on Monday, they need to kind of shape out their week. So Monday, they're in home base, they're in their home room. There's no moving around on Monday for the rest of the week. They, they determine my daughter always wants to see AP Cal Plus, <laughs> go figure. But that's, that's kind of nice because then teachers can see the week too and plan for who's coming in their room or who they would like to assign. So there's a kind of this agreement by midnight on Monday, everybody's <clears throat> In the schools where they have these resource periods in effect, do the teachers report that they typically are booked for a 30 minute period? Do a lot of kids see this and, and is there a good uptake? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, you know, we've got some anecdotal data and it's it's mixed at times. Like I think some, you know, some teachers would like to see it utilized better in the schools that they're in. Some of the teachers reported to us, like it's just, it's, it is another study hall. Sometimes they've got scheduled things that they want um, students to do, but but a lot of it is on the students and, you know, in other places, they're like, I asked students at Grafton High School, what if you didn't have resource period? Like, what if they decided to take it away? And now I was with like AP Chem kids at the time. They're like, oh, I'd be so mad. <laughs> and I, they, they see value in it. These were seniors in AP Chem and they see value in it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think right now our teachers are working towards seeing value. They, they want to see the, how it's going to unfold. And I, um, I'm, I'm very confident that we'll be able to build in the structures that are there to make it as useful as possible at a neutral impact. It's just another study hall for kids. That's neutral. 
Um, that's not but, why we're doing this. <laughs> but, but for the kids who use it, yeah. then it's a greater yeah. impact because you have smaller numbers, more access to your teacher, more, yeah. more intimate access to your teacher. Sometimes it's even one-on-one -on -one, um, where that's not offered throughout the day. So it goes from neutral to really positive. So. It's just another example of a South Campus freshman schedule. The blue is what is like um, examples that Adam put in there for what they would choose to do on a particular day or what they're assigned to do on a particular day and resource. It's just a, a sample, but the connecting with teachers from an absence um, because absences is a concern, especially for our teachers and our parents and catching up with what, what right now is being perceived as like two days of material in one. It's not necessarily how that's going to look but um, nevertheless, absences are important uh, to, to keep track of and to make sure you're getting help as a student. So resource period would be, could be utilized in that fashion. Um, on the, and then on their A day, they would go from resource to English nine, to art, they'd have lunch, a study hall and social studies nine. And then on the B day, they come for resource period, work with an English teacher to revise a paper, get some help, Spanish one, science nine, lunch, biad, geometry. And then they'd repeat the following A day, but they'd start with resource period. Everything's doing going well. So they're gonna just use it as a study hall and they're gonna go to English, art, repeat. B day, they'd use it for a different purpose. So, you know, you can see where, um, where it could build a um, some student ownership in uh, their learning. Would they still have homerooms or would that be built in for resource period? I think that would be built yeah. into the resource period, yeah. Right now we build in homeroom time into an extended third hour when we need them. You just absorb the resource period and let students know ahead of time, hey, three weeks from now on Wednesday, we're gonna, you won't have access to your teachers because we'll be doing this. A huge benefit is we're not disrupting any schedule, not disrupting any classes, instructional time. Students just lose the resource period for that day, but if you let them know ahead of time, they can work for Once a month or more often right now, we send out a, a schedule, we email all the kids, you'll be in an extended third hour, we have kind of just, that's, that's become our routine. Um, we would no longer have to do that. That's not the reason, but that's, we could be building in some better systems by having that resource period. Um, this is a North Campus example. Uh, the red now is resource period, A day, B day. Connect with math teacher on homework struggles and resource, go to AP Physics, go to study hall, have a US history, lunch and modern lit. The next day they're gonna do broad, they're, well, they're in Broadway company. <laughs> so they're going to, uh, uh, they're gonna do a small group practice. They have AP stats, engineering and, de and design. Uh, Chinese, lunch, and then of course, if they're in Broadway company, they're gonna go to Broadway company. So, so on and so forth throughout the week, that gives you a week and a weekend glimpse into kind of how that would unfold. Um, every other week, you'd see your A-day teachers three times, and then the opposite week, you'd see them twice for extended periods of time. So this is what we've gotten after we've reviewed, this is review, um, so I won't hit on all of these, but this is kind of what we presented to students, faculty, uh, and parents regarding that flexible time, that re resource period time. And this is um, not an exhaustive list, but a definitely what we've observed um, a lot of school districts use resource period for. Um, students having common time, we've talked a lot about that. Staff can work with students who are absent. Staff can work with struggling students and assign them. They can have enrichment sessions. They can have pre-teaching sessions. They can have review sessions. They have makeup tests and labs. There can be school-wide culture building efforts. Uh, or just school and information at the tech team meeting yesterday, the teachers in the, on the tech team um, were just kind of talking about just some structural things with how they build, um, how do students know um, how to access certain things in Canvas? And I was like, well, teachers are telling them. Teach, all teachers are using instructional time to teach them how to use this tool. We could be building in some of those things to make sure students know how to, how to operate the basic use of those kind of devices. Um, School-wide academic career planning lessons could be a soft start, time for students to collaborate on group projects. Actually, that I added that one after I met with kids, and the kids are like, that would be nice. I mean, kids are um, oftentimes assigned uh, in a, a group, and they don't always socialize with those people necessarily, and um, they're supposed to complete something collaboratively, and they're matching out schedules, important skill, but they know they could schedule some time in the library and work together during resource period to complete some of that work. They kind of thought that was a good idea. You want to talk about increased instructional minutes? Yeah, um, we can absorb instructional minutes just by simply having fewer passing periods. Now, our passing periods would be longer, and the benefit to that is we can align the buildings. That was, we could have gained 
a tremendous amount of instructional minutes if we kept the building separately, but that keeps our conflict rate, it keeps our building separate, it, it uh, really has that feel of two buildings, and if we can align our buildings, that, um, that makes it easier for students, less conflicts with their classes. Um, and so in, in absorbing those nine passing periods and really turning them into three or four with a lunch, uh, we're able to um, gain minutes. Uh, the second part of that is you have more effective instructional minutes. We were all part of class where every uh, every time when that bell was about to ring with three minutes left, we all wanted to get up and go stand at the door, right? So the fewer times you have transitions, the fewer of those minutes you lose at the beginning of, oh. oh, so just wanted to give everybody some scope. That was 40 minutes. So in a class, we'd have to end our conversation right now. See you tomorrow. And we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> okay. part, of, part of my experience is what I taught in five different schedules, including the seven period, eight period trimester, four by four block and AB block. That was one of my biggest um, struggles um, uh, in that right when I was about to get students to um, to understanding the content that we're working through or empathizing with the character, we had to cut it and go. And um, truth be told, what we've been doing is talking at you for 40 minutes. Yep. So yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Our instructional time today are not great, right right. Right. but I just wanted to give scope into that time, right? Because uh, if we were to go another 40, I think we would really have a full understanding of what we're talking about today, which is part of the benefit. Um, so back to our original point that, that more effective instruction minutes, the fewer passing times you have, the, the fewer times you're losing your, um, your students and trying to engage them when they walk in the door and trying to keep them engaged until that bell. Um, so that's all data proven on, on those kind of things. So we've had a lot of these things already. Aligning both campuses can lessen the schedule conflicts. Um, you're going to see in the survey results, I don't think the schedule conflict is seen by most as, as, as a big deal. Um, so it can't be the big why. Um, and it's not a big deal to it's their child sitting in the counseling office trying to make a decision about why can't I take this class or that class. But I get it. They, you know, they, they're focused on, 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 I think, the right things and that being the instructional time. And we can continue to look at ways we can reduce that schedule conflict rate. Um, from the inception of the schedule, a uh, current schedule with the two buildings on different schedules, students have faced challenges with overlapping class times because of the travel time involved. And our teachers experience that, too. Um, we would still have teachers that travel between two buildings. And that, that, that is a complexity, especially with resource period, we're gonna have to consider when will that teacher be available to which students on what days and what building. Um, I can't change that. We have Al Vandertai, we love you, and we named a commons after you, but he thought it was a good idea to uh, have two buildings and we can debate that another time. But nevertheless, that is one of the complexities that our school has that other schools don't have to consider. Um, passing period would be long enough for any student to take a class in either building. And although that doesn't immediately create any kind of efficiency this way, we do think in the long run, as we think about our facilities and think about how we use our space, um, having that schedule in place could it be very helpful and better efficient use of space. Right now we outfit two art spaces, we outfit two tech ed spaces, we outfit two music spaces. Um, we have science labs that are, are duplicated and outfitted. Now some of that we need <laughs> you know, nearly yeah. 2,100 students. Um, but some, some of that is not always the most efficient uh, use of space. So we, we have to think about that in the big scheme of things. It's not immediate. That would be a more long range thing, but that's something to think about. Um, talked about conflict rate, shared equipment, and double spaces. That's what I was getting out there. Um, we looked at that already too, I think, increased step of instructional time. Um, the decreased stress anxiety thing has um, also kind of been an interesting conversation with people. You know, we want to talk about principal's cabinet, and then I'll talk about some of the additional yeah. comments we've learned. Um, so the comment there was was uh, from my very first meeting with principal's cabinet last year, September, end of September, uh, when I asked, uh, and I shared this, I think, with the board, when I asked the students, uh, when I first meet with them, I asked them to share something they just love about being here, uh, about their experience, and something that is a challenge for them. And, and uh, to a T, um, uh, the, the most, probably the saddest part for me was the amount of sleep our students get. Um, I had them raise their hands and um, if you go to bed before 9 a.m. or 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m., 12 p.m., and most of them are around 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And then they'd come back to school and do the same thing over again. And, and we all know that that's not healthy. It's not good for the brain development. It's not good for absorption of, of learning. Um, and some of the comments that uh, I just let them talk kind of um, at me for a while. And, and one of the comments was Arrowhead wants us to challenge ourselves. They want us to try new things and be involved. And they don't give us the structures to do that because um, they just said their days are, if they want to be involved, their days have zero flexibility to them. They, they have zero autonomy over what they do. It's all, um, it's all kind of stamped for them. Um, and it was actually from them that the idea of 
a schedule change came because we had a student uh, who was in the AV block and came here and said, I have never felt more stressed since I got here because of the structure of my day where I didn't feel stressed and I had just as tough a class as before. Um, so great conversation. And I just met with uh, our newest members of cabinet, um, both cabinets. I have a South cabinet now that, uh, that started this year, but the, um, the North cabinet, I did the same thing and they shared the same sentiment. Like we're tired. <laughs> we, we don't have an option. We, if we don't do our homework, then we're not ready for the class the next day. But if we do our homework, we don't sleep. Um, and it, it's all, uh, you know, how they're structuring the time. And, and they felt if we, they could get into some time where, where um, they had the two day gap, they could adjust their sports practices, their engagement with um, Broadway company and, and um, the clubs that they're in and those kind of things. Um, and that would be a huge uh, benefit to their, um, just them being able to have power over their own days. Balance. Yeah, some balance. Um, one of the parent conversations we had um, mom was very explicit with us. Like, not your job to figure out their stress and mental health. I agree. <laughs> I don't, yep. and we don't want to, but we do care about kids. Um, we care about their, their well being, and we want to make sure that our, um, you know, that our system isn't bringing undue stress. You know, it's, it's, there's, you need stress. Stress mm -hmm. is it's something that builds, you know, an understanding of how to cope and how to deal with life's pressures, and all of that's important, but we just don't want undue stress based on just the way our, our, our schedule is built. And, um, you know, people in block, students in block, I'm certain have some level of stress. Mm -hmm. I, we're not trying to say this is the silver bullet, but I think um, a lot of faculty commented to us uh, in the debrief after the October 27th visits, like the feel was definitely different. It was audibly different. Um, just a little bit more. Um, so that's, I, I think just something to, you know, that's anecdotal. Uh, I don't have, um, YRBS data or anything that demonstrates that they have less stress in black schools, but we have certain kind of schools. Question related just to the, the homework that you mentioned. With increased structural time, do we do we see the amount of homework decreasing or staying the same? So in studies that I've read um, from all over, Georgia, Missouri, Colorado, Virginia, some in the state of Wisconsin, state of Washington, on the whole, homework can go down, but it's not going to eliminate homework. And it shouldn't. Like it kids that done. need the daily practice need the daily practice. Foreign language, math, that daily practice is going to be important. And that's that's a concern for us as we think about, and especially in two areas like that, we want to make sure that there's some touches on the, on the topics every day. Conceivably, I would imagine homework could go down. Um, but I'm, I, I, there were teachers who said, I think when we were talking about the nine AP classes that would lose instructional minutes, there was a lot of discussion about what that would look like for homework for kids. I'm like, well, that is counterintuitive. We're not trying to build um, more of that uh, into students. They're, they're going to have to have some homework and it will be purposeful, but they will have the practice. Hopefully they'll have the confidence. That's the other piece that I've read on the whole. And I have some summaries of that, of that data is a lot of the data that is collected on the block, although mixed data on achievement, it's pretty clear that Teachers end up liking it. It's a lot of stress to implement, no doubt about it. There's stress and change for kids. Kids don't always like change. I get that. But once they've settled in, they liked it. Um, and I think it's because of that feeling they had time to, to complete some things. Um, you know, homework, there's a place for homework here. <laughs> we, need, we need some of that uh, skill building. Um, but right now, students on the whole experience quite a bit of homework. I think I get advocacy letters. I have a stack of advocacy letters from my years about this thick, and I would bet at least a quarter of them are about how much homework is there. When we look at the survey data results in a moment, you'll see that comment come through as one area of relative concern for families. Yeah, Not the biggest concern. Let me maybe re-ask re my question, because I think it's homework is two different things. There can be kind of self-taught continued instruction, sure. and then there's homework where it's skill development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you see? Yeah. You see that separating, and it truly is that that skill development homework versus the continued mm -hmm. self instruction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I think you see that though, just like when that alarm rang, off, rang. If I'm the teacher, yeah. oh, geez, okay, you're going to have to finish reading page five yeah. to ten on your own, or you're going to have to do this or that on your own. Yeah. Where just more time in class, maybe the kids can even start some homework with the teacher there to answer questions yeah. or. 
Yeah, and I think the answer you're... Long, as long as the, the plan for the day doesn't just be kind of what we do today, but twice as much. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's gotta, it's gotta be and you're echoing, Tim, you are dead on. You're mm -hmm. echoing a lot of the concerns that we've heard yep. um, from families and from students. You know, is it going to be just twice as much because now I only see you every other day. And and, and I, I I get that. And that would, again, be opposite, I think, of what we're trying to build. So that would be important as we move forward and as our course teams look at their curriculum, you'd be looking at your pacing and determining, you know, what, what happens. And a part of that conversation is to be the purpose of homework. Um, Alpi Cohn, which is old research now, but you know, you would say math and reading, and beyond that, there's a lot of purpose that really grows learning. Um, now that's one one researcher, one author, but I would think some of that is is accurate, especially at the high school level. You need to be reading, reading deeply. You need to be practicing those math concepts and skills. Um, so, Sue, some simple, other pieces, I'm sure that that are purpose. Simple question, following up here. Um, so, if we're not just doubling the amount of time per class, and still ending up um, having to reach the same uh, end of book or yeah. you know material um are we still aiming at covering the same amount of material in each class and can we just flush that out yeah i mean i think you know no curriculum is designed in a way where it's like lesson so math is way more regimented it's probably the most regimented 1.1 1 1.2 1. Mm -hmm. and they might be doing some of that um kind of combining. teaching and then combining. Some of those are concepts that they can be looking at. You had a visual yeah. that you use with the students where you'd say, there is a particular concept that might take the full block or two blocks to teach. And there might be the next set of learning targets might be some quick concepts that I can teach two or three in one, in one block. And that's the pacing that we need to be looking at. I, you know, lessons don't always go sequential. Sometimes when I was teaching US history, um, we'd be in a unit on the civil war and we're hitting, you know, certain certain topics or certain targets, you know, um, uh, in a day. But in between that, because, of, you know, I was always behind in U.S. history. I was, I was catching up with my colleagues. I say, OK, this is where we need to be. All right. So this is what your homework needs to look like to make sure we can get there. I think we alleviate some of that um, by building in some of those reading skills to the classroom. But there is truly a time to say, like, is the depth breadth? and depth, we're gonna to have to make some decisions. Um, breadth and coverage and depth, there may need to be some adjustments to make that happen. I have no doubt about that because you can't you can't click along in a block like you could in 40 minutes daily, 40 minutes daily. That's not to say what we're doing now um, is the right way to do it, although some would believe, and certainly parents demonstrated in the survey, they like the 40 minutes of it, 40 minutes of it, 40 minutes of it, I think the 84 minutes, we're gonna to have to really show them how we build that time. We've been talking a lot about reading and building reading skills because we're concerned about some of the achievement data we're seeing with our reading across the board. Um, where are they going to do that practice? It has to be built into the day. Um, purposeful practice around the things that we're noticing. Students are not demonstrating college and career readiness. It's not just going to happen on its own. We have to build in. That's going to cause some adjustments you know, in the English department, for example. They have to start building in those things more purposefully. We have to give them time to do that. Um, so it's adjusting more than anything, but I don't know if I'm if I'm giving yeah. Craig the picture very clearly right now. But I see, I can try to give a couple yeah. examples. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I don't want to yeah, to um, I can give you my examples as a teacher. Um, just as an English teacher, I, my goal was um, when I only had a 50 minute period, I had I I taught one thing essentially. Um, uh, whether it was we're talking about um, a novel that we read or uh, or doing some writing and then uh, you know having our peers look at our writing or something like that that's what I could do in a, in a day to change it up when when I taught in the block I could have my class look very different every day I could have 20 minutes of us reading something and sharing and, and um, conversing about it and then writing uh, a response and, and engaging with a different part of the brain and, and creating a debate which we could have for the next 20 minutes and then having conversations with our peers on uh, why we believe the way that we do about this character or something like that, right? So it looked very different, felt very different for every 20 minutes. Um, I could also have the ability to have a, uh, a discussion about at the end of something, at the end of a unit, a novel uh, that we're discussing that might take 85 minutes and that the kids really want to just get as deep as they can in. I had that flexibility as a teacher. A math teacher at Cedarburg explained to me how it doesn't do what you're asking, which is do we just take two two units and put them on? 
right now that's what we do because that's the time that we're structured with. And he explained it to me and I'm going to butcher this, um, but he said, math comes in skills, right? So I'll use it as simple as I can as an English teacher. Uh, so I teach X squared plus Y equals Z. That's one day. I teach it. We do it as a class. You do it for homework. Come back the next day. Now I'm teaching X squared plus Y squared equals Z. Okay. So now we have two exponents on there. I teach it. We do it. I send you home. We do the homework. Come back. Now we're throwing that uh, final exponent on there. So it's X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared. Well, his comment was, those are all the same skill, right? So I can teach that skill holistically in my class. And it's not three days of class. I, I taught it in three days of class because that's what I had. That's the structure I was given. Now I can teach it all holistically so they can start at the foundation of that skill and we can work our way up all in one day. Okay. Again, I'm probably not explaining that as well as I should, but that's my understanding of math is that you can do some of that. Yes, there are going to be days they're going to have to go, yep, this one, we're going to do some work. Now we're going to learn this skill, do some work. There are going to be some days with that. There's no eluding that. Sometimes you just need to do that. Uh, but for the, for, for the majority of the days, it's up to the teacher and the teacher has uh, immense latitude now to create really um, impactful learning in the class and engaging with the kids in different ways. So. It's just shifting different, mm -hmm. um, but you're still going to have the same concepts that are in the framework of a curriculum. Um, to, to that end, mm -hmm. and I think Sue alluded to it earlier, that there is great merit in the consistency and the repetition of things mm -hmm. that putting into the framework of a math example. Yep. If that student isn't doing that every day, isn't going home to practice that every day, if in fact that learning is every other day, what concern is there for the lack of repetition or consistency on the impact on learning? Is, is there? The, the counter to that, there's a couple counters to that. One, we're getting deeper, so we have a better understanding. We're just peppering. Right. How much of that are we really remembering at the end of it? I don't remember any of my math. Um, and, and that's not because I had bad teachers. I had great math teachers throughout my high school with. That's because you lived in Michigan. I would. Ow. <laughs> ow. Sorry. <laughs> at least we can. Once in a while, I get the opportunities. <laughs> yeah, we only know how to add seven points. <laughs> when the Lions with the Packers. Uh, so. yes. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, so the depth is there. Um, it, it was uh, when we first shifted to it. I remember a comment that, um, which is not great, and Tim, is to your point. Um, students typically are going to do their work on the next day, so they are exposed to it every day, right? So, if I'm a student and I take my math class, I'm not going home that night and doing my math class. I'll do it next the next day, right? Because I'm procrastinating. So, I'm getting my math class. I'm getting exposure to the skills. Getting my math class. Getting exposure to the skills. So that uh, there are workarounds and there are. Um, um, there are ways to minimize that um, that gap. I I have never seen it, and and I don't think any school that we visited said it's a problem uh, in terms of um, that that learning embedding with our students with their students. So to that kind of to that same question and your example, of that, do, do you would teachers have the opportunity or be allowed going back to the schedule of the it's, you're going to be in your A session Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Would the teachers be allowed to have something due from a Monday class due on Tuesday and submitted electronically? It's, would that be allowed? And is that okay? Because if you could detract from the other part yeah. of the schedule, it's like, not knowing what the right I answer think, is, but, but yeah. uh, I think right now you have some of that happening in some of our 8 AB day blocks. So I don't know that's as um, off the cuff. I don't know if that like allowed versus like, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what how that behavior would support what we're looking for. And that's yeah. those daily touches. It, it, it could be good. It could be that. like a recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. or it could offset. I don't know. We haven't talked about that. Yeah, if it happens with frequency, I can see it being bad, right? Because it takes away the benefit of it. Um, but I could see it being a positive in that. Hey, I, you know, this would have been due tonight, but instead we'll make it due tomorrow, so that when we're when we come back on Wednesday, everybody has it done. We can get into something, right? Like I could think of it as an English teacher. I need you to have your paper written by tomorrow night at eight p.m. I'm going to look at them from eight to ten p.m. so that we can talk about them in class, right? Mm -hmm. So it gives the student a little maybe maybe extra time. 
I don't think we want to make a, a culture to do that. I think that puts our kids in a tough spot. Yeah. So you said the reading and writing has had gone down or that they're not there. What are we attributing that to? Well, we're investigating that right now. We've looked, we're looking at different diagnostics. We picked up a different diagnostic tool. Um, students are reading less. I mean, on the whole, students are reading less. Um, uh, not because we don't assign reading. I just think the, the joy of reading and the, um, uh, the book checkouts, although I, I think are still really good, we have some solid readers. We need to be purposely looking at what's being measured on assessments that are demonstrating this, this slip in reading. Um, we're looking at inference making on main ideas. We're looking at um, students being able to support with evidence what that main idea is trying to say. And so we're looking, you know, met with Dave Girac for a long time today, um, different ways that we can uh, build in those strategies at a universal level. Um, but we're, we're, you know, we're looking at students that, that have some significant um, learning delays and we're investigating all the reasons for why that might be. We're, yeah. We're very concerned about the trend. And we know time impacts it in this. As we talked about the nine APs uh, and the value of their time, we also recognized that an uh, English student who goes through a traditional English pathway oh. here, uh, by the time there is a graduating senior would would receive over four thousand minutes fewer fewer minutes of instruction than schools around us of, of English, um, because our English classes are typically forty minutes. And over the course of a year against an 85 minute block, which most schools around us have, whether it be AB or, or uh, four by four, uh, those students get a thousand to 1200 more minutes in their English classrooms and biology classrooms and math classrooms and that sort of thing. But when we're looking at reading, we're, we're trying to look at all avenues and is that impacting our students where we have, you know, five to four to 5,000 fewer minutes when, when they're graduating or when, when they're a junior taking the test, they've had 3,000 fewer minutes than, than everybody else taking the ACT test. So, so Adam, are we, are, are we talking about uh, on this slippage on reading, are we talking about that as a slippage from an objective uh, standardized uh, value or relative to other schools around? It sounded like in your answer just now, it sounded like you are referring to other schools. No. It, it's, it's through objective oh, assessment. Yeah. So Aspire and ACT, uh, yeah. our state report card and rankings are all are value added in those. And I'll touch on those actually a little later. Um, have, all decreased and gone down and are very low re relative to the state. That was actually going to be, sorry. Okay. <laughs> that was actually going to be my uh, my comment when you were talking about uh, the reading classes being 40 minutes. So how many of our English slash reading classes are 40 minutes versus currently 60? Like, we have um, all of our lit classes currently are 40 minute, except where students take English nine and English 10 as a combined block with social studies. Our writing classes are double period every other day right now. Okay. Um, so, Dave, are you still there? Right. You, yeah, do you have? I don't have the exact numbers, but you, you said the right yeah. classes. Yeah, right. So um, we, we, we don't have that built on time right now. So um, is there a way to, uh, not that this is the catch all either, but is there a way to make more of the English classes uh, block in the current schedule? Is there a way to have that discussion? I did talk to a couple of the English teachers. Um, and of course, they teach both um, block, current block and uh, the 40 minute period. So that, I mean, that's, if there seems to be a deficiency um, in that area, is, is that something that we can look at as a school of expanding the number of classes that have um, in English and reading? Right, so, so we certainly look at that. We have to have something to um, balance that. Uh, if we block it and it's every other day block, I think, I don't know if we're talking about an everyday block, that would be different. Um, then you have to have something on the opposite end of that to, otherwise all of our students would be. So we'd um, have to block study like freshman biology, right? Ninth grade biology opposite ninth grade English which then that's what the student's in, which is kind of- Just to make the schedule work for yeah, students. Right. Yeah. Um, that makes sense to do it with math then, because I would assume our proficiencies in math have increased as well. Our proficiencies in math are doing- They're, they're doing well. Well. Yeah. Like, I just wonder if there's, if this is not, if this doesn't get adopted for next year, is that something that we can look at the short term? If that seems to be a lack, especially at Arrowhead or just in general as, as a, as a, you know, statewide issue. Does um, it have to 
do with the theater school? You know, an aid theater. School? We're, we're, it, I, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I, when you look at their where their data sits with um, up through eighth grade, but we are looking at that. I met with Melissa Thompson. We sat. She's sharing a whole bunch of data. We're working with our superintendents to figure out how we can get better share because of our system being K eight and nine to twelve. We don't have a consistent data. Um, house to 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 get the data on our incoming freshmen as smooth as we as a k-12 district would so we're working through that um, meeting with counselors from feeder schools um, on monday actually we're talking about that transition process learning who are the students we already have a process where we learn students that are in interventions already we want to make sure we know who are students we need to be considering in terms of their reading skills um, and what would we do with that information we need to make sure that's part of the transition process as well um, so we're working with that. Dave Gerrock is leading a team of theater school uh, English teachers and high school teachers to talk about that transition and look at those skill sets, what's being taught, what's being assessed. So we're on it, but um, <coughs> but we need to have the right system and supports to make sure that that's a sustain that's sustained. Right. And I think this, the tools is a resource period. Yes, yeah, right. That's where I was just going to go. Yeah. 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 I guess one other question, just because this was new information. Um, are other schools also seeing issues around this reading readiness or is it just Arrowhead or like, what are we seeing as a trend if we're looking at from up there? I know that the Elmbrook schools have a, a sustained silent reading process right now. <laughs> Our teachers have served it, I believe, but at least one of the high schools in Brookville. I don't know what caused that or what uh, would be the reason for that, concern of, for students to read, uh, I'm guessing, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure where the other I schools are. Sure. I know you're um, Brooke, yeah. having a, a big struggle with the meeting as well. And I think COVID really affected that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's been a consistent part of our data for years. So we looked, we can look back at our data for six, seven, eight years. And I've done that and we've talked about it. And um, schools that we would compare ourselves with have um, what's called value added data, which, uh, which is significantly higher than ours, gap closing data, which is significantly higher than ours. We have not been able to pinpoint the problem yet. So value added means where they come in as freshmen. To how much we grow them their junior year uh, assessment so two years of, of being arrowhead students uh, we're not seeing the growth that other schools are um, we know we have great teachers you can see their classrooms and, and watch great things occurring we, we haven't been able to kind of pinpoint where um, our struggle is and manifesting that in terms of success for our students their success on those assessments unfortunately is part of what dictates their future we don't we, we never um, shoot for higher scores for, for ranking purposes. We, we shoot for it because it's an outcome that helps our students. Um, I just additional benefits. I think we've hit most of these. Um, you know, I am sensitive to the fact that I don't want to feel like a used car salesman here, and I'm pitching <laughs> because that came through in data from uh, parent survey in particular. That's not our intent, um, but because we've continuously learned these are the things that have been perceived as benefits. Um, it's a little bit more reflective of what students experience in college in that they tend not to always have daily classes. Sometimes they might. Um, do they always have 85 minute classes? No, but they tend to have longer classes. 55, 60 minutes is fairly um, uh, prevalent. Uh, long periods allow for more involved in in-depth lab or project method learning. Um, I did speak with parents who were concerned that we weren't shifting to some um, totally different learning model from the standpoint as direct instruction is still part of the model. Absolutely. Um, direct instruction plays an important role in student learning. We know that. Um, but we do know that the hands-on piece is important. And our learners, you know, TLT, we had a really good discussion on Monday. Our, our learners are different. COVID did something to the way they engage with material and the way they um, you know, it's not just COVID, but I just think our learners are different. They need, um, some of them just, just need a different hands-on. They need to be able to move a lot. Um, that's just the way they're built. And there's a whole host of reasons for that, I'm sure. Um, but as we're thinking about that, that engagement piece is so important. And the, um, not that it's project-based or anything like that, but projects, solving problems, it might not be this, um, you know, big project, but solving a problem and defending a, point of view and all of that, that those are good practices. In 40 minutes, it's just more efficient to do more direct instruction. And so that's the way we kind of do some things. Now we build in projects, we have labs, we do in-depth learning, um, but I think to a degree that we could do that well, I think the, the blocks have seems to support that. Possibility for more access to APs. We don't want students taking eight classes of AP. 
Um, but right now we know that our conflict rate comes from uh, the way we've structured the schedule currently. When we pulled the data on our current schedule, we recognize we, um, it's very difficult to get more than uh, four APs right now anyway. AP is very rigorous and um, as it should be, it's a college class. Um, we want students, if they're prepared for that, to be able to take as much of that rigor as they want to. Um, and so we want to support that uh, within reason, of course. But if it's not that, it's following other interests and passions. Uh, we have some students that are really into uh, the engineering program, and we want to make sure that they can take the math and science and engineering class they really want to take. That, that, um, is, that has come true, um, come through and true in the way our students um, you know, vote with their feet and their schedules. They've got a lot of passions and interests. We try to build programs to tap into those things. So we don't want to see reduced opportunities for students. We want to see at least the same, if not grow, opportunities. So we, we believe the block schedule allows for that. At least getting us on a more similar schedule allows for that. Longer class, class periods can be more engaging if we structure it right. And we have a lot of, a, a, a lot of people, experts on campus who can help us learn how to do that. Um, and then, and, and we'll bring other experts in who other districts have brought in as well to, to transition. Um, and we've talked about that more valuable study hall. What would be lost? Um, Multi-length classes um, uh, we think would be lost. Uh, the ability to take nine classes, which right now you really can't do anyway. 99.7% um, of our students take eight or less. That daily touch piece came up a lot. Um, and so I suppose I don't see that necessarily as a loss, um, but that came up a lot, at least from a parent perspective, as we look at those results. Um, cost neutral, do you want to talk through those a little bit? Yeah, if a student is asking, this one's come up quite a bit too, in that um, uh, I think a lot of parents and students feel, well, I'm missing twice as much work in that class. Well, it, that's that's not exactly accurate. Think of it this way, when you come to school for a day, you have you get seven hours of learning. <laughs> Whether it's 50 classes or two classes, seven hours of learning. And so that seven hours of learning needs to be recovered if you're absent. So when you come back the next day, you have seven hours of learning to gain from your teachers. I, I, personally, and I'm not gonna put it up there, but personally, I think it's easier in the alternating day block because now I, as a student, only have to connect with three or four teachers to get that work. And I have a resource period that I can do that. Where in our current schedule, our students are trying to connect with seven to eight teachers to get seven to eight different uh, pieces of content for, from their classes that they missed on their absent day. So we call it a cost neutral because it's, um, you know, it's seven hours of learning or seven hours of learning, depending, doesn't matter how many classes. Um, I personally see it as uh, easier uh, on the student because they're only having to connect with three to four teachers rather than seven to eight to garner the learning lost. So we believe our staffing is a cost neutral piece. We, we've looked at it, we've studied the schedule, we've looked at right now where things are balanced or, or in some cases imbalanced, we're confident we can maintain our programs and if we're maintaining our programs, we're maintaining our staff, um, which is important. And we've talked a lot about the achievement data piece um, and, the, and the reduction in D's and F's. We review D's and F's every quarter. Um, I'm ha somewhat happy to report our D's and F's are at this quarter seem to have gone down and they continue to from last year. Um, at COVID time, we were concerned um, about how many D's and F students were, were racking up. Um, we look at that every quarter. We program leaders look at it, have conversations with teachers, want to make sure we're supporting those students. Um, but do we have the right systems in place to be able to support is, is important. So we're not overly concerned about our DNF ratio, uh, but we, you know, we've never satisfied with that. That's just that's a bottom line for us. We want every student to find success, you know, and be ready for their next stage in life. So survey results. Daryl, are you ready? This is this is your show. <laughs> Great. Oh, yeah. um, well, this is these are the survey Spired results from oh, Luxembourg yeah. Casco, but we don't need to necessarily go through these right now. Um, we can come back to that. These were the before and afters um, that you had taken yeah. from when you were at Luxembourg. So when you see the presentation, you'll see uh, parents asked about resource and block, students asked about resource and block, and. Um, we had very similar situation where there was a lot of resistance, change, new, that sort of thing. And um, I think the, I, I'm trying to remember if it was December that we surveyed our students at seven to a T, almost 75% of families and students uh, preferred the new block schedule and the new research period to what was previously. So just something to share. Yeah. 
So we'll come back to the kind of lessons learned, but this is um, this is where things shook out in the exploration process in terms of, oh, oh yeah, it's quick. I'm going to have to scroll through this. Yeah. I'll oh, through. okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. you want to, all right. So I work closely with Sue and Donna on the, um, on the survey where we wanted to um, reach out to three influencers on the AB, on the proposed block. So we talked to students, teachers, as well as parents. Um, this is a little background information. We can just get through this because I think Adam and um, Sue went through it. So two main objectives, just gauging the experiences of the current schedule format, which is a blend of everyday 40 minute and 80 minute EB block, and then also identify the advantages and areas of concern if the district decided to transition um, to this. Um, the approach that we use, we use an online survey, and I do want to strongly emphasize when we released the survey um, to the teachers, it was shortly after that same day of them shadowing the uh, other school districts. Um, we had a great response rate at 78%. Um, just a little bit of background on this here. We do have 43% um, did identify that they have taught a block class here at Arrowhead, and we have um, representation across all departments where anywhere from four to 13 teachers in each department uh, voice their opinion. Students, um, we had 786 participate, 41% response rate, and 89% um, of the students said they did have at least one block class here at Arrowhead in the past two years. Um, and then also parent and guardians, um, we had a 17% response rate, um, lower than the other two, um, but just kind of put it in perspective, we had 17% when we did the climate survey last November, I think we had about in the high 20% range. But still we have 40, 483 people that took part, it's still a robust number um, for analysis. And just to note here too, you know, we, it's all across the grades and we did have 29% of the people surveyed have students at Arrowhead and they also have kids at the feeder schools that will be coming up. Um, just scroll here. I'm going to share a lot of information here in the details. Um, we identified six things that to need to know. We did see most students and parents prefer the current schedule format versus the proposed 100% AB block schedule. I'll get into exact numbers later on here. Um, teachers have mixed feelings uh, in terms of preference. Only 16% prefer the 100% AB block. And another 27% are unsure. We had 48% prefer the current schedule format. And we did have 9%, doesn't matter to them either way. They're cool with whatever format we have. Um, we also have teachers. So that's, you know, just a paint strong picture for the, you know, proposed schedule, but the current schedule we have today is not perfect either. Where we did see teachers um, with the current schedule, 31% agreed that it works. So um, that was one very eye-opening to me. And then um, as we mentioned earlier, I know one of the um, things when Adam and Sue rolled out that we had like 37% of students didn't get the class schedule that they wished for. When we looked at a bunch of other attributes, we did see this. Um, it was less of a concern for the students compared to other factors um, that we evaluated. Um, there are, we did see in feedback too that both teachers and students are concerned, meeting just every other day will prevent, develop a stronger relationship with one another. Um, in terms of the resource period, we did see that teachers do see the value of it. However, there is concern how students will manage their time during this time. So we'll get into the detail more here and we're going to just kind of go into each of the um, targets here, starting with the teachers. Um, in terms of involvement of, you know, one of the questions was like, okay, how are teachers being um, educated about the proposed AB block schedule? We did see, you know, just conversations with other teachers here, 77% um, of the people serving did report that they did shadow um, other schools and um, conversations with the administration and also 
um, other outlets from Arrowhead Advisor to websites um, and attending board meetings, et cetera. On average, you know, roughly three to four things, um, resources that they use to educate themselves about the proposed black schedule. I have a question. Yes. Didn't all the teachers uh, go to the other school? Yeah, we didn't. I mean, most, almost all. We had a few absent. We had a few at other conferences. Um, um, I think we had about 13 that didn't attend the school. So, um, so either through absence or because they were at other professional development opportunities. But I, I don't know if they missed that as part of the response. It should be a little bit higher than that. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. And we did see, we asked like today for teachers, have they taught block schedule? What percentage is it roughly? Um, so we do see here, you know, 42% um, have taught at least one um, class, 14% said every single class that they have is block schedule. Okay. Um, okay, this is a little bit of eye chart here, but um, <laughs> you'll see it later on. The one thing that I want to emphasize is the, um, the, the box down on the bottom, where we did see in the shade of the blue, navy blue here, it showed... Um, it said the current 10 period schedule is what is best for students. Only 31% of the teachers surveyed said they agree it is the best. Down below is would they support? I have to get yeah, closer to the AE <laughs> block, which 100% of classes are 80, it's actually 85 minutes, but 84 minutes and meet every other day. Thank you. Um, only 19% agree with that. 55% um, as you see in the orange there, um, disagree with that. So that's a you know level of concern there of what's being proposed. Um, when we ask like, okay, if you had to choose, this is one of the things of the top six um, insights that I shared with. Um, we did see, you know, in terms of the proposed schedule, 16% um, are in favor of it. Um, roughly 50% are okay with the current schedule. And then we, when we asked um, reasons for preference, on the left-hand side, um, there's only 17 that are here, 17 respondents. Um, these are the ones that preferred the block schedule. Um, we did see um, all of them said more time for learning activities in class, um, longer periods, um, less classes per day were the top reasons of the people that prefer the current schedule. Um, able to see their students every day. That was the top thing. 67%. Um, easier to make up um, work for students if they're absent, 63%. Scroll down. Then this is um, regarding the resource period, where we do see that, um, you know, the advantages here, teachers, I mean, they see, you know, only 3% said, I'm just directing to the bottom here, said there's zero advantages. 3% said there's zero advantages with the resource period. 97% see advantages in some form or fashion, where um, chance of being caught up for school um, classes with the teacher, um, more opportunities to get help rise to the top. Um, the disadvantages, um, they do see that students um, will not use the time appropriately. So that's one of their um, strong um, concerns about the current um, resource period. When we look at the students um, of the eight, seven, 800 that we surveyed, um, we asked them about academic concerns. You know, what rises to that? Um, one of the top things is, you know, balancing homework um, and after school activities, including their jobs. 48% um, mentioned that as a concern. Stress rises to top, nearly half there as well. If you can scroll. Um, we have asked, you know, students, um, have they taken black block schedules uh, classes before? And pretty much 90% of them said they have. When we asked the question, um, we have two charts here, saying the options that are available today. We asked them before the survey, before rolling out the proposed block schedule, it's like, what class, what type of class do you prefer? Is it the 40 minute every day or the 80 minute every other day? And we did see the vast majority, 85% said they prefer the 80, the 80, um, the 40 minute every day. 
And to the right there, when we asked about the options to be explored, um, where they did get a chance to see um, the rollout of the AB block plus um, resource period, um, they preferred the current, 86% uh, preferred the current format. And then in terms of reasonings here, um, to the right there of preferring to the current schedule, um, they feel the block classes are just too long for them. Um, nearly everyone mentioned that. And then um, on the flip side there of the ones that are, the 9% that are preferring the blocks, block AB block schedule, just had more time for students to finish their homework or get started um, on homework in class most of the time. And then this here is a scenario where we kind of gave a scale, like we had about 10 attributes and we just said, okay, which one is the best? You know, is it the proposed block, the current block, or it's the same? So when you see the, um, the gray bars here on the right, that means it's the same. The orange means the um, current schedule is more favorable and the um, blue represents um, the proposed block is more than most favorable. I have to get up here again. <laughs> oh, can you scroll it back? Oh, sorry. This slide here. So um, when you look at it across the board, I mean, for the leaning towards the current schedule for each of these attributes, it's anywhere from like 61% to 79% or 80% feel the current schedule is more favorable. Um, go ahead and scroll to the next one. And then when we ask parent and guardians in terms of academic concerns, um, you know, the top thing rises here, the balance. It's managing stress, the top two, pretty much it's just in line with the top two that um, students mentioned. In terms of information sources that parents are getting, um, a variety of information sources, roughly four. Um, per parent and conversations with kids and emails from an Arrowhead administration um, rose to the top, their sources. And here just um, with the parents they mentioned, 83% said their kid has taken at least one block class here at Arrowhead. And, and, and again, when we look at the parents, we do the, the um, when we looked at the students, they were much more strongly in favor of the current schedule, current schedule, while the parents, um, we do see a little bit of, um, you know, less being that way, where it's, um, it was like in the eighty-five percent for students. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, but when you look at parents, it's about sixty-six percent, roughly. And again, the um, pretty much the resistance with the block scheduling, um, pretty much the same categories rise here. Classes are too long with. Um, saying the reasons that they prefer the current schedule, the block classes are too long. And then also um, other things, was able to see their teacher every day, 61% identified that as well. And then when we looked at the viewpoints of current and block schedule, um, fewer attributes, but um, where they do see um, parents prefer the current schedule um, between 49 or 46 and 61% for each of these attributes and um, the one that rises to the top in terms of the advantage of the proposed box scheduling it's only at 35 percent but it is higher to the other ones just saying meeting with teachers during the school day for assistance so those are the insights that we gathered from um, each of the teachers students and um, parents <laughs> we did ask some open response questions of Hey, do you have any other concerns? So there is a lot of uh, rich, rich information there available, but that's not into this report, but it would be available. Yeah, I'm going to forward that. Yes. So thanks, Daryl. Yep. Thank, Thank you, Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Daryl. Yep. So, um, you know, we, uh, we were glad that we've had the opportunity to engage our students and our parents, faculty, in the whole um, discussion of. Um, you know, what people value in learning, uh, what they want to see at Arrowhead. Um, and certainly the survey results, although represent only a percentage of parents, students, and um, certainly a good course of faculty, we've got, um, well, we've learned a lot and we're fairly convinced we have some convincing to do. Um, I think it's safe to say. 
Um, our recommendation, if we do move forward because of that, would be, I don't have this in the presentation. Oh, no, I do. Um, our recommendation would be um, to delay. If there is a vote um, in December to, to move in this direction, it would be not to implement it for the next school year, but for a year out. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Adam. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm hoping the board can uh, patronize me here with a, a few minutes. I actually created a statement. Uh, most of you know me by now that I don't read anything that I do. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to that, that um, that I don't need to get into tonight, but it's very rare that I'll actually read a statement and, and uh, formula, formulate something prior. Um, I find myself uh, that I work better just speaking from gut and heart and, and experience. So um, I did want to speak because I want the board to have the full uh, context of why we're here tonight. Uh, you heard some of it, uh, and I'm going to uh, address that uh, in, in a, a few minutes here, but it's not we saw an issue, we need to change the schedule. Okay, I think um, there is a bigger picture here of what we hope uh, for Arrowhead and for our students. And so I, I, I hope that I can touch on that in, in the statement and I'll kind of go as quick as I can. Um, so it's been a complicated journey and unfortunately has surfaced other issues uh, that we have uh, currently with communication, culture, trust, and purpose at our school. And adversity will do that. Uh, we know that. We have work to do, um, as all do, and we welcome that work. Uh, to address those pieces. I know as a board, you have a difficult decision to make when you're deciding this. I had a mentor uh, who previously told me, if decisions were easy, we wouldn't need leaders. That's about as accurate as it gets. Um, so uh, I know uh, the decision that rests with you. Um, uh, Sue, myself, and the administrative team have ventured down this path knowing that we would meet resistance. Uh, all change and all progress does meet with, it, with resistance. An example of that happened five years ago here at AHS when the staff engaged in implementing Canvas. Uh, this is not a significant change, but a change reflective of necessary progress that's happening in education. In doing so, Donna Smith was often the target of negative discourse uh, and bringing something very uh, that a very vocal staff deemed not necessary at AHS, affecting the greater thoughts of the whole staff. Enter COVID uh, and the necessary evolution of learning, and we now realize how powerful a tool Canvas is, and as we're going through our curriculum understandings, we see how beneficial that is. If we would have surveyed the staff at that point, I believe you would have had similar results um, to whether Canvas is of value or not. Uh, you have just seen survey data from 17% of our families, 41% of our students, and 78% of our staff. Uh, this states to me that, uh, that there's still a lot of questions, misunderstandings, and work that we need to do. Uh, we're fortunate to have so many long tenured staff and low turnover. That is a huge benefit at Arrowhead High School. Uh, in this case, it makes these conversations harder. We speak from uh, from our personal experiences. And if this is our only experience, then uh, then we hold a uh, personal pride to the work that we've done. And that, that is challenging for our teachers and we understand that. Messaging has been tough. Uh, falsities and misunderstandings uh, are shared faster than we can keep up with them. You all know that as a board. Um, social media is a powerful tool. Sadly, parents, students, and uh, even some of our staff have fostered some of these, uh, some of the inaccurate information. Uh, the most entertaining part of all this were rumors started about me, about this being uh, my uh, doctoral thesis, and that I'm going to work for a schedule change company when I'm done. Here. <laughs> um, I do find those entertaining, and I find most of this process just still uh, a positive. Um, it's not my doctoral thesis, and I didn't even know companies like that exist, so um, I do love my job, and uh, so the purpose is for our kids. Um, I, I want to share some facts with you. You heard some tonight, um, and they're not shiny or welcome facts, but I believe one of my roles as a principal is to face realities head on, and I wish we fostered a world uh, and a culture where it's okay to recognize our struggles and address them. Um, so I'm just going to read kind of a list of uh, observations, and I knew many of these actually before I even took the job. Uh, I researched uh, as heavily as I could into what is going on at Arrowhead. Our enrollment has decreased uh, 400 students from our peak, which was about 2,400, and nearly 200 over the past seven years. And we are anticipated to do decrease another 400 over the next seven years, which would be an 800 student decrease from the peak of enrollment at Arrowhead High School. I'm not, in no way am I saying the black schedule is gonna cure this. You'll, I'll get to a, to a purpose here. 
fourth, seventh, eighth, sixth, twelfth, thirteenth, thirteenth, fifteenth. Those are our consecutive U.S. rankings. They have trended backwards for the past eight years, fourth to now fifteenth. Our state report card, which you just saw, uh, places us at only exceeding expectations. Uh, the top tier, which uh, contains many of the schools that we would compare ourselves to, is significantly exceeding expectations, and I believe we should be there. Our ECT scores have dropped since uh, all students were required by Wisconsin to take the test eight years ago. The value added scores for reading, which we touched on, are below the state average. Okay. Say that again, our value added. So when our freshmen test to when they test our juniors are below the state average. So the amount we're growing are below the state average. I'm not okay with that. It's not fun to say public, uh, but um, it's something that we need to be um, aware of and, and work towards. Uh, our overall growth for student achievement, achievement from freshman to sophomore to junior year is in the middle of the state. The achievement gap uh, is in the middle of the state as well, meaning how our lowest achieving students compare to other schools. This means that half of our students, uh, half the schools in the state see greater growth and achievement than our struggling students. We have some of the highest property values, socioeconomic status families, and education of families, meaning the education level that our parents have reached uh, of any school community, which takes out a lot of the factors that hamper progress in schools. Uh, we have one assembly and celebration each year for our students. A school as successful as we are, where we have state titles coming in left and right, kids competing in all different avenues and all different clubs, we only have one assembly, and it's our homecoming assembly because it was deemed too disruptive to our current schedule. That's not the experience I think we want for our students. Uh, recently, we visited 10 other schools, all of which staff shared have better facilities and learning environments uh, than we have. We don't have time for students uh, that can, so that they can see any teacher uh, during each day. An estimated 80% of schools across the country do. Of all the schools and staff that we visited, nearly all schools and teachers said they would never go back to their previous schedule. And if we are doing it right, why have we never hosted a school, to my knowledge, that is looking at our 10 period schedule. Uh, I've shared this data with our staff and uh, I've had anger directed at me. I've told I'm not an arrowhead guy. It stings a little bit to hear that. Um, move my family here. Uh, my kids are scheduled to be here uh, and I'm um, bringing up things that sting a little bit, but our reality is uh, because this is the result and this affects our students, how we do with our kids. Uh, if we are not improving, our students, learning experience and opportunities, then we have greater issues to work through. None of this, I wanna be very clear, none of this is the fault of any one person. None of this is uh, the blame of any department or any teacher or any leader. Uh, schools, systems ebb and flow, but we have uh, the uh, power to change when those, um, when those tides turn. Uh, I expect, uh, in my role as a principal, I always expect Arrowhead to be number one. And that is not because I wanna be number one, it's because that is an outcome of great work. And that uh, recognition gets our students opportunities and those opportunities come in, uh, in uh, greater acceptance to colleges, greater scholarship opportunities, greater opportunities in the workforce, greater leadership opportunities in military and, and, uh, and whatever they choose in their path of life all come from greater recognition of our school. We have some very bright spots. I want to make sure that we understand that we are a great school. I would not be here if I did not think that. Uh, we have great athletics. We have great AP scores. We have great activities. Why do we have that? Because we have put in place structures that support those. When I interviewed for this job, I asked what the struggles were. I got the usual two buildings, large school. In my mind, those aren't struggles. Those are challenges. I was also told that change does not happen at Arrowhead High School. We are living wide. The bigger the ship, the harder it is to turn. There's an image that circulates, and many of you have probably seen this change model, where there's a person standing on a, on a podium, and he has a group in front of him and says, who wants things to be better, and every hand raises. When he says in the next picture, who wants things to change, there are no hands up. <laughs> you cannot have things be better and continue to do the same thing. I hope that we never uh, strive for stagnance. When faced with change, human nature takes over. 
and we move to protect our own personal interests. It's natural. I fault nobody for that. Uh, fear and anxiety and the fact that uh, it will take uh, work to evolve our content, curriculum, and instruction takes over our thoughts. Uh, as your principal, I'm charged uh, to do what is best for all of our students uh, in our school and our school community. Um, and we want to consider all students. Uh, our administrative team doesn't have a single class that we're an advocate of. We don't have departments. We don't have experiences uh, that we uh, hone in on. We looked at the whole school. Many of our staff, I give them credit, have been thoughtful, have been inquisitive, and have done all they can do to learn and understand what's going on. Some support the change and some are still struggling with it. We understand that. We can have respectful and informed disagreements. That's healthy. In the comments of the survey, it's easy to see who has approached the consideration with positive intent and who simply is struggling with the idea of change or work. I've said it in every presentation, our administrative team have zero to gain from this. We are spending nights away from our family tonight as you are. We've spent several family uh, nights away from our family. Sue does not sleep much, I know that. <laughs> I sleep fine. Uh, <laughs> um, we have nothing to gain with this. This is our belief that we can do great things for our kids. And this schedule can be the start of fostering that. I moved here with the intention of building on what is here, not uprooting it. That was never my goal. Uh, we moved here. My family's here. My kids will attend here in eight years. Uh, no decision is considered without that. Please understand that. No decision is considered without me looking at my son, who is five years old now, going, do I want my son uh, to walk through these halls as is? Uh, Sukasa attended here. She taught here. She's been in this current schedule, and she supports a change. If there's anybody who has bled more for this school, let me know. But the fact that Suka said is supporting this change, I think should be a statement. Uh, our current system does not have something for everyone as stated on our website, um, because if that were the case, students would be able to choose the different lengths of the class. That would be something for everyone. We have a structure that offers different types of classes, but our schedules, uh, our scheduler dictates which structure those kids are in. Um, Throughout our conversations, we've realized that uh, mainly uh, students don't want the block because they can't imagine sitting through 85 minutes of lecture. We agree. That indicates that they may be experiencing 40 minutes of lecture frequently. That is not best practice and something that we need to work with our staff through if that's the case. Sometimes that is just student perception. Shorter periods are based on a, an older understanding that the teacher is the keeper of knowledge. When this schedule was created 40, 50 years ago, we did not have the internet, we did not have phones, we had a textbook, and the teacher was the expert of knowledge. The teacher is still the expert, but some of that base knowledge that we used to get from the teacher, we can now access in any way that we want. The world has evolved and our instruction must as well. Testing has evolved as well. You can. Uh, read studies on how the ACT has evolved in the past 20 years to move from content to application. For 20 years and beyond, we have carried an incredible reputation in the Arrowhead. I'm proud to be a part of it. And the current realities are that our enrollment is decreasing, our, our facilities are struggling, the data and rankings are dropping. Uh, I am not fabricating this data, as some people believe. It's all available online. That's where I got it. Uh, and a schedule change is not the cure for all of this, but it will give us the structures, the time, the access to attack many of our struggles that we are seeing right now. We hope to look at learning differently and begin to reestablish uh, Arrowhead High School as a leader of learning in, in Wisconsin. In the end, board your decision will not alter our work. We understand you have a decision to make. Uh, we understand that we have work to do. Um, so regardless, we will continue to work and continue to grow Arrowhead to have uh, the best opportunities for our kids. We believe the schedule makes that more accessible. Uh, personally, uh, I've learned over the past few months that I, it's clear I have a lot of work to do in building relationships with our staff. That's on me. Um, I have a lot of work to do building trust and common purpose with our staff. That's on me. And we have a lot of work ahead of us to remedy some of the struggles that have surfaced. Um, but what we believe is that students deserve the opportunity to have access to every teacher. We believe uh, supporting student wellness and not in less rigor, but in providing the tools and the opportunity to learn such skills as time management, self-advocacy, self-efficacy, among others. Uh, we believe longer uh, time allows students to think and apply, not just hear and remember. 
Uh, we believe in aligning our buildings so that we can actually share our motto of one school. I believe that our students and our staff will thrive in this opportunity because that is what I've experienced personally. I know the fears that come with it, but I have full faith that our staff of great teachers uh, will support our students and do great things if we are able to change the schedule. Too often great systems fail for lack of growth or fear. I shared this at one of the curriculum meetings. It's a great story about Blockbuster. It was at the top of their game and uh, is non-existent because they refused to give up late fees as the evolutionary idea came from their leadership team of offering a streaming platform. Circuit City was the best tech score in decades for a decade, but failed because they refused to pay higher rents for more accessible locations because they believed that that would hurt their bottom line. Best Buy did not. I prefer that we not refuse to grow because of fear or misconceptions that we uh, are doing everything right currently. We are doing great things. We can still grow and be better. 20 years ago, the board, staff, and community were all committed to ensuring the best arrowhead. There are notable tangible elements that came from those efforts, like a football field and a hockey rink, uh, which are beautiful uh, elements of our school system. But the more important outcome uh, of those combined efforts was a culture of excellence and opportunity and refusing to settle for anything less for our kids. Uh, it's, uh, I hope that we believe it's time to reassert ourselves as the best, uh, the best in the state. And in doing so, we will provide great opportunities for our students. As I said, nothing here tonight or in December will deter our work. I appreciate you listening to me. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Adam. Thanks, Adam and Sue and Daryl for your work with the survey. Um, now we are just moving on to board members' discussion and next step. So I guess if anyone has any questions or would like to open it up. And then we would uh, vote on this in our next board meeting, whether or not to go ahead with it. Anyone want to start? I have a, I have a thought. Um, so, you know, obviously there's a... Um, there's a lot of pushback. First of all, uh, thank you, Adam. I really appreciate everything that you bring to the table here. Uh, I think uh, I can speak for the whole board that I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, I think we can speak for all the administration that they're excited to have you here. So I'm so glad to have you on our team. Um, so I don't want to gloss over that. Um, I do want to say that there is something that I think we can talk about potentially implementing uh, next year as an option and that is the research period. Um, I think there's an opportunity to potentially um, add this. I think that that's, that seems to be a real positive. Um, and I, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of pushback from any side with regards to that. You know, is there an opportunity for you guys to talk about, you know, you know, when, you know, as Tim and, and Tim, as the Tims mentioned, you know, what time, what time of the day might that be? What, what time might that be best? Um, I do think that, you know, having, you know, I know it's just anecdotal, but having three girls and three different, you know, types of classes, I think we've hit most of the teachers in the school at, at some level at some different time. Uh, that's been a challenge for them to be able to touch base with some of their teachers. Um, and so I think that that could be real positive. Um, so I don't know if that, uh, I'd hate to bring this forward to the next meeting uh, have the potential of the whole thing being shut down when I think that that's a real positive and that could be a, you know, a good start with regards to change and, uh, you know, new opportunities for our kids for growth, for touching base, for uh, expansions. Uh, the other thing that I do think uh, is another thing that we should consider and start talking about, and I know this isn't probably something that can happen by December, but uh, knowing that our weeding scores are dropping so much, um, I, as, a, as an individual board member who don't completely understand the whole process, you know, think, thinks, you know, why don't we offer more block classes in English and reading? Why, why don't we expand that area? Why don't we make that more mandatory? Because that seems to be, <clears throat> that's something that they're going to need for their whole lives. And I don't think you can get too much of it. And so, you know, is there an opportunity there? Um, those are those are my global thoughts. I have a whole bunch of little ones, but I won't touch up touch base on any of those. We 
we had some consideration of that of trying piloting the resource period. Um, in doing so, we would have to make uh, a decision to, um, to in two ways. Either one, our classes drop to about 36 minutes, our 40 minute classes drop to about 36 minutes to absorb the time to create that resource period in our day, because we're we're limited as to the amount of minutes we have per day. And um, so we have 10 periods right now, nine with a lunch. And so to have 10 with a lunch, we'd have to shorten all those class periods. So that's one option we could do that. The other is to take away one of our current periods and it would drop us to an eight with a lunch and a resource. Mm -hmm. So there's there's been some consideration of that. We had talked about that. Um, I don't know that we came to any conclusions. I mean, to your point, Chris, and um, you know, this has been a learning mm -hmm. experience. He's not going to write his dissertation on it, but I might. Um, <laughs> uh, I so in doing so and having just so many conversations, you're right. Right now, if we just take today in November, the perception seems to be a little bit more in favor of a resource, and I don't want to see the whole thing go out the door if we can't we can't um, shift that perception and um, and and work through the the challenges a little bit further. Um, I think we can do it. I think. Um, can we do it for next year? We'd have to, we'd have to hustle. We're not against that. Does the resource period have the same gains in an eight period day? We'd have to, we'd have to dial back, learn a little bit more about that than where we've been because we've been so focused on making it an eight AB day schedule to see where the resource period benefits along with, with, uh, the other day block is getting at the deeper learning and the, the opportunities to, to build some instructional time. Um, if that is a possibility, as opposed to not doing anything, then I would say, let's try that. Um, because I, my, going back to 2019, before Adam was here, and when Adam Holt and I were um, recognizing that, <laughs> Adam Holt, recognizing that there were some things that um, we wanted to see done differently for student support and building in interventions and, and making the, um, the, the process work for everybody. I mean, we, we were dialing in on a resource period at that time. So that was kind of the impetus for the whole conversation. Now, I told Adam, I'm all theory, right? I went, like he said, I went to school here. I've been part of this place since 1988 um, and love it to my core. Um, I do believe that, that um, to get some instructional um, engagement and, and active learning, I think the A day, B day thing is there. But if we can't make it happen, um, resource period is, I think, a, a really good improvement to where we are right now. I agree. And I think I wouldn't want to see, I, I for one, wouldn't want to see us go down to a 36-minute period. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd like to take out some FSO time, some study hall time, and, you know, and put that in there because that's really what that would be for a lot of students, too. It would be a, a study hall, you know, and if you blocked it around lunch, that'd be, you know, one opportunity and, you know, everybody'd be there. Or if you think that the beginning of the day is the best opportunity for that, you know, however you do it. But I think... Uh, Fair enough that there is a lot. One parent acknowledged this in one of our conversations. She was right. This is a lot. It's a lot. It's a big change. And so we're not only bringing forward a change in which it's, you know, somebody's like, it feels like you're just blowing it all up. And it's like, well, we don't mean to blow anything up, but in some degree we are. Um, can we focus on one or the other and make that resource period of one of the, um, you know, pieces we really, we, we dial in on, we bring people into the conversation, we shape it. Um, there's enough to learn with potential software uh, and a lot to bring, you know, change in for the students as well um, and change of behavior. So that could be gradual. Um, by doing so, I will say this, having eight plus lunch plus a resource puts us in a better position to try to pilot a block if we decided we wanted to do that or add other block classes. Um, right now we can't pilot even because we have such a complex schedule. It just, it was summer, I said, here's where I'm at. Here's as far as I got. And we would just have all these decision rules just to pilot it to get a feel for it. So mm -hmm. as, if that's an incremental step to perhaps a longer runway vision, um, and, and that's where, where we want to start. You know, I think we, if, as opposed to nothing, I, I'd be speaking. So Sue, I remember in one of the other curriculum community meetings of the last month or two, you did mention the possibility of piloting this, maybe even for two weeks or something like that. Uh, I thought that sounded intriguing. Uh, now I'm kind of hearing you from the last 30 seconds, maybe that's not even 
practical? It's just you, tell me why. So okay. So without going through the, the ins and outs of our master schedule, one of the pieces is we try to build in an A day, B day. So that's four blocks plus would we pilot the resource period, okay? Um, I almost need like a chalkboard. When we, um, when we have classes that are like one, two, two, three in 60 minutes, where does that class go? We'd have to make decisions about those nine, which is actually 21 sections of students. Do they go with one? Do they go with two? We have to be able to communicate that to kids so it's not it's not um, confusing. So that's one element. We have already classes that go along with our lunch period. So we have to decide where those lunch period classes would go opposite fifth or sixth in a new block schedule. That's about half the students. Um, Challenge is it's not overcome like we can't overcome it, but it's just enormous challenge to communicate. And then we also have classes that are already in a block. And so where do we do with the what do we do with those in light of where we are in a 10 period day? It just because we got so far, and I was like, I I need like an army to help me figure out kind of where all these pieces go. It's so complex with 191 different courses, 10 periods, 2,000 students, two buildings. We couldn't be on the same schedule. Maybe we could be on the same schedule. We built in the resource period uh, into the pilot. It just became like, I'm not sure. Because we don't want to go poorly, you know, and by making you know, communication is going to be half the battle. And I just, there's a lot of decisions to be made about where things would have to go on a pilot to make it happen. If you had all 40 minute classes, yeah, then you could double up and make it work. But when you have 40 minute classes and 60 minute classes and 80, and you're cutting out. Either way, you're cutting out a period to make the A day, B day work. What do you do with that period right now? Because kids are already scheduled in the class. So I I can look at it again, but I think that I I exhausted I exhausted uh, looking at that puzzle at some point in July and was like, I um, I needed I, I actually said Sue Gasso's helped us kind of create a mock a mock schedule. And all that does is put sections into a new a new block. So it put kids in room. It didn't get put kids anywhere. It just put sections in rooms, and then we could see where the conflicts emerged. And that has only gotten us so far. So. So I think what I'm hearing is if, once you dug into the details, it's really not practical. Yeah. I don't. I don't want to say no because yeah. I, I would love to make it work, but I. I yeah. I couldn't get there. Because, but even if you figured that out from a schedule standpoint, which is probably not even half the battle yet, it, it's getting them the, the, the classrooms, the teachers prepared to actually have the experience we would expect right. in that 80, 85 minute period. And if that becomes a miss in the pilot, because we didn't boost that up right, mm -hmm. then it becomes negative and stuff. Exactly. How would we have time between now and the yeah. pilot to do the professional development yes. that would really be a genuine trial? Of yeah. yeah. And, Adam, what was your quote again about leadership? <laughs> which, which one? If, <laughs> if decisions were easy, we wouldn't need leaders. So, uh, I mean, big ideas happen so seldom in the public sector. Um, when they do their tools above, Oftentimes, uh, the, the incrementalism is the lifeblood of any government institution. You know, small changes are made where there are as little cost and uh, not a lot of conflict. And so, when we have an opportunity to make big decisions and big changes, and we have an administrative team coming forward all in agreement that's kind of a rare thing <laughs> but if we went back to the day that uh, our 40-minute class schedule was first adopted and two years later somebody said holy cow we're, we've made a bad decision here that it probably never got to the board even if that conversation happened because getting you know relative unanimity among administration is itself a Huge achievement. And we're sitting here today and we're being offered an opportunity to make a big decision in an environment where we have been incrementally worse and worse for a series of years. 
And we're talking about instead of taking on that big decision and dealing with the blowback that we're likely to get from staff and from parents, we're talking about going back to the incrementalist teeny tiny changes and hoping that that's going to stem the tide. Um, I think change is good. I think change, even if it is entirely neutral with respect to what the outcome uh, is likely to be, refreshes an organization. It breaks down barriers and it takes um, ownership of bad historical ideas kind of off the table so it's easier to make changes in the future. Uh, I, I have to say, I was sold on this almost from the first moment because I was told that it added two weeks of educational time to our kids' schedule without having to pay another penny in staff. <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about a budget-friendly solution to a real problem that seems to get worse every year, putting our kids with our teachers for two more weeks a year seems like a total no-brainer. I'd be happy to lose a school board election if it meant that at the end of the process that the kids got two more weeks of education every year. I think I, I'd, I'd lose that election very happily and go off and probably do better things on Wednesday nights. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more enjoyable. <laughs> I, I, I would say this, that as I, as I listen to this stuff and the whole concept of the time savings and passing from class to class, I think is at least in my mind applicable to the uh, homework problem. And the kids have two homework. I mean, it's overwhelming. I, it's a, uh, I have great compassion for the kids who are writing emails to administration asking for some consideration of that thing. And so when I think about a kid going home um, every single night of the week with four questions to work on for homework and social studies, and he's got or she's got, you know, similar assignments in their other seven classes. And so you're sitting down and you're working on math and then social studies and then English and whatnot. And if you're anything like me, you get done with English, you close that book, you get up, you get a drink of water, go say hello to mom and dad, come back and sit down and work on the next thing. Or instead, you have social studies every other day in a block schedule, and let's just say they double your homework. So you've got eight questions, and you sit there and you go open the same book and you work through those eight questions. You've just skipped a lap around the uh house and the change from subject to subject, I say your homework, at least in my mind, gets done more quickly. And maybe we knock some time off the schedule that kids have to block each evening. And they get two days to prepare for every class so that if you have a class on Tuesday and you've got a test coming on Thursday, you, you've got two of these access periods where you can go connect with the teacher if you're desperate. Uh, it may still be one for procrastinators in the group, Tim. But <laughs> I prefaced that with I used to. That's <laughs> when I was a high school. <laughs> but 30 plus something years ago. I would just say the, that absent any other spectacular idea in the room about how we take a problem that has perpetuated itself for seven or eight years now. Uh, and would shake up an organization and give everybody a chance to do a total refresh. Uh, I think this is the one that we ought to get on and we should do it quickly and, and leave little doubt in the community that that's the direction we're heading. And whether we adopt it next year or the year after, I guess it's uh, a different issue, but, it, but I think it's really important to say that we, you know, this report card came out you know, it's in the newspaper today, uh, or whatever we call the Journal Sentinel these days, since I haven't held one in my hands in a long time. Uh, and I, I have to say, I was embarrassed. And I think this board needs to do something big to address the problem. That we've got. Thank you, Tim. I, well put. Um, 
I, I just have another uh, observation that as I looked at the, the survey information uh, up there, uh, one thing just stood out to me primarily, and I think there are other ancillary uh, issues that go along with it, but it's, it's initiative. Um, inertia is the word I mean. Uh, we are doing what we're doing, and it's easy to keep on doing what we're doing because that's human nature. And it's hard to change. So you see numbers like up here, like how many teachers really like the system we've got now? Is it best for students? 30 some percent, 32 percent, whatever it was. How many want to change? Nah. <laughs> so there's kind of off of Tim's argument there. Uh, that those two things are uh, irrational, illogical. They don't. They, they they run up against each other. And it seems to me that um, with uh, some further discussion, uh, persuasion, if you will, uh, education of the staff, uh, maybe these that hesitancy and that uh, uh, reluctance to change would diminish over some time, I, I would hope so. So, uh, yeah. I find today's argument compelling. And I didn't come here um, expecting perhaps to hear an argument that compelling um, in favor of this. Um, the one thing I guess I would counter to this is this. Given the report card information that we just recently found, I really appreciate um, your comments earlier, Adam, with regards to putting everything on the table. We can toot our own horn. There have been many, many great accomplishments, continue to be a lot of success here. But nonetheless, we can never um, neglect to address any challenges that we have. And I appreciate saying that. If we were to put a new scheduling system in place, foreseeably, there would be a lot of time and attention directed at just that. I would hate to see us not give a proper amount of time and attention directed at those challenges that we just recently learned. And certainly they've been coming at us for a period, but we are where we are right now. And so as long as on the other side of things, there is reasonable assurance um, that those challenges will likewise be given the time and attention that they're due, uh, that we're not then reliant on a schedule for full impact on our challenges. Um, I guess I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of mentioned it uh, in my statement that, um, and Dave is still here. He is breathing down my neck <laughs> for uh, to attack this this reading structures, and we've had good conversations because it's it's very hard right now because we don't have the structures within our school <clears throat> schedule to support what he wants to do. When you have uh, forty minute classes for English classes, you do have to kind of upset the apple cart because. If you want to focus on reading that is going to be that day something has to give out of that right um and if we were able to engage with a with a, uh, a resource period there are a lot of pieces that you can add to that you can add additional time with your instructor you can add support time for those struggling students uh remediation time remedial time you can add act prep sessions which are specific on those skills sometimes our students have the ability, they learn it in a class, and they just don't know how to identify that skill and put it into practice. And we don't really have a time to do that. What we have to do right now is take it out of class time to do that. We have, we have no other structures to support that other than to say our 40 minute class today is going to be focused on ACT learning. That doesn't sound great to any student because um, that's not the intention of learning. The intention of learning is to learn, and, and what manifests out of that is skills that that um, that can be shown on. on uh, on standardized tests. So um, I, and the other fact is we're, they'll simply have more minutes, you know, a, a, a thousand more minutes in an English class, even if you took it and just said, for those thousand additional minutes, we're gonna have our students read. That would have an impact. Not as great as an impact as we can have with with uh, better, better approaches or better purpose, but just that would 
would start to turn um, our our results and our students' uh, success in those venues. Um, so um, it's very tough right now, and it, and it becomes a tougher challenge if we don't, um, if, if nothing changes with our schedule, we, we, we're going to have to get real creative. Um, and we don't have to get as creative. We can focus more on the, on the structures and the practices rather than getting creative on um, how on how in classes um, with our current schedule. So um, I, as an English teacher myself, I, I um, have full faith that, again, not just the schedule, engaging with our teachers and engaging in different structures will will start to turn that, those results. I, I had a couple comments. Well, first of all, I want to thank Sue and Adam for their work, because I know I've seen them here late at night, you know, having conversations with the group, so I applaud that. Um, looking at the data, there's um, one of the things, you know, I think the success of this is, you know, the teachers being all gung ho on it. And I didn't really see that in the survey results. I saw, you know, some anxiety and things like that, where it, it was like about a quarter of them were either for it or, you know, either whatever you do. I feel that is, um, very concerning to me um, if the not not saying 100 percent of the teachers are on board but more than 25 percent need to be on board for me to feel comfortable switching to this um and then also you know just seeing it with the students too you know there's resistance there but i do um like chris mentioned with the resource period i do like that um because i know some people said you know the study hall if you walk into a study hall it may not be the most structured thing, uh, but this resource period maybe sets that up for success, especially if you can do that delegation of, okay, Daryl missed chemistry these next these two days. I'm going to assign him to meet him, him and a couple other people during that time to learn. So that's where I'm at. If I could just jump in and, and I guess echo Daryl's comments administratively, when you do the reading and the research and you hear from other schools and other students and other staff saying, you would never go back. Like you're doing 40 minute class periods. And it, when you immerse yourself in it, it becomes easy to be convinced. But as Daryl said, our, we're not ready. And I think we came into this thinking, we're gonna do it next year. We're gonna do it really well. It's gonna be terrific. But as leaders, we're not leaders if we have no one following. We have to have people on board. And so that's why the recommendation is we need more time to get that enthusiasm and excitement. And I think part of our, our request, if the board is looking, you know, if your majority consensus is this sounds like a schedule that could be beneficial to students, I guess we would ask, don't don't tell us um come back and propose it again in a year because in that year it you'll have a handful of people that'll be nope we're not doing it we're digging in our heels and even if we're allowing and promoting professional development and offering it if it's not a sure thing why why do i spend my time where if it's we believe this is what's going to be best if that's how the majority feel to say it's going to be a year from now. And then we know that's where we're headed. Teachers know that. Um, and that learning, families, teachers, professional development, it's with a purpose for a whole year. And then if someone is digging in their heels saying, uh-uh, no way, can't do it, well, then they'd have some choices to make. A teacher that says, I just can't, I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna change, I, I'm not sure where they go since most districts have that schedule around us, but they could choose to do that rather than choose for a year to try to put energy into bucking a, a change that might happen. And I feel, you know, do I feel confident? It's like, oh, let's wait for a year and do it in two years. I feel my two senses, um, you know, some of the opinions are, decisions that if it was a student or teacher made was based on their current AB class. So I feel 
let's, you know, is this in, you guys know more, but is that something we need to revisit the approach with things? Yeah. Is that good? Because, you know, with my sample size of two at home, you know, I, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I mentioned that too. And it's like, you know, I, I feel, I feel that would be like, okay, if this can, you know, what you guys say, you know, that's more of the backing. Yeah. We've learned a that's, lot. That's I mean, something we, to consider. I, I, I think this has been um, very eye-opening just for me personally on a whole host of levels about the organization. Um, I am confident um, that with focus, what gets focused on gets done. And if this becomes, this is what we need to focus on, it'll happen. Um, I think we need some unity with our faculty on this. Um, mm -hmm. I thought we would be, I actually thought we'd be in a different place by now. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like when um, I've had conversations, I mean, people can disagree on certain aspects of it and that that's okay. That happens in a robust uh, organization. I want them to come in and tell us why we shouldn't and mm -hmm. and, and hit on um, some of the nuances and, and concerns they have. And, and that's led us to solve some of those challenges of like dig in, like this isn't going away. Parents, students, you know, AP uh, minutes being lost. And we were like, we, we can't continue to go forward with it this way. It just, it is, it is one reason um, why there's, why there's some resistance. So if we can keep problem solving together as and be unified in that, I'm, I am confident that we will make strides there. Um, I did think we'd be further. That's why the recommendation of your hour. Um, um, so, I think I think there's just I think a lot I, you know I didn't go into like what we've learned but the change the emotions of study change and the emotions of change um, are there um, and you, we have to work when they see supports and when they see results it tends to be when you can get over the hump uh, of the emotion related to change you know it's the who moved my cheese a story for another time. <laughs> I'm showing my age. So that's what I was thinking too. You know, why don't we add that resource period and cut down on that period out of the day? And that'll be a little bit of stress in the meantime. And then that gives us the next year for kind of a soft sell almost and to prepare people for eventually the 2024-2025 and we could I don't know if we need to vote on an eight period day and then with the saying that we've been after that 2024-2025 would be a lot. The one concern I had that I didn't bring up before was you know I read through all the questions and everything and the, the ABHD with the black schedule I was wondering if at any of the schools you toured if the they, you ask questions about that. How did that work with children who are a little more, you know, hard to focus and that's oh, kind of a long time? Good to talk about that. Um, we asked those questions and I think they were And the studies that have been done regarding students with attention deficit disorder um, uh, or who have um, oppositional defiant disorder or just emotional disorders that. Um, uh, two big studies were done. They, they unfortunately are from the 1990s. Um, so that's the, 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 I didn't see anything more recent than that, but they're quoted often. The key piece is structure. Um, students with structure and students with built-in support will, will thrive. Um, they like structure. They like engagement and fun. So even in a 40 minute class, take a break, go to your next class. If they don't, if they don't have structure, they will, they will lose focus. Um, uh, so we have to be mindful of how to build in those checkpoints and the structures. And we get, we have to do that now. We, we need to be doing that now. Um, uh, so, but as we think about 84 minutes, you know, I had a conversation with a teacher today about how she structures her current block class because I just observed it. And, you know, I noticed, you know, um, we did some review. They did a Kahoot as a class where they had to answer certain questions right or the whole class got eaten by a shark. Anyway, it was, <laughs> and they, they did it together as a group. It was really good and they've got three, three chances to do it. But that was the review. They went over that. So that was about 10 minutes. Um, then she modeled something. It was a health occupations class where they had, um, they're doing vital signs right now. And she modeled how to take blood pressure uh, using a stethoscope and a blood pressure cuff. And they had watched a video on that previously to see the picture. She modeled it. They labeled and talked through the names of everything that was on there. Then, so that was about 10 minutes. 
maybe a little longer. And then the kids had time to practice. They had stethoscopes, they had a partner, they did practice. She, they were all listening for the tick, tick, taking blood, blood pressure. They practiced, can't do practice more than twice because you pass out, I guess. What do you blood pressure take? I learned that. Um, <laughs> not good to do that a lot. You can't be like constantly practicing. Um, the bell rang. Now here we have a bell that rings in the middle of a block class because not everybody's on a block. They took a break, took a brain break. It was perfect timing. Um, they came back. They kind of reviewed what they just did. What, the, what was that like? What do they still need to practice? So they feel like they're getting it. Okay, that was good. They moved into the next piece. They were continuing some reading on vinyl signs. They were able to partner up and answer some questions about vinyl signs. They completed their homework in the bell ring. Um, so that was a very well structured. There was four to five activities built in. I asked that teacher, what if we don't no longer do that block? She's like, I can't do this class. Not a block. I have to play it, you know. So opposite situation. She's like, you know, we, we, we are always applying. We're always at that level of applying what we're learning. So we have to think about that with attention deficit students or the students who need application, they need hands-on, they need structure, they need movement. Um, a lot of them need to move. And so right now, if we're not building that in as effectively as we should be, we should be, but we also need to be thinking about that uh, in the block schedule. With 20 minute, 15 minute um, snippets, you're able to, um, you know, shift and hold that that focus. It's a concern, um, uh, for sure. Um, uh, but knowing that it's not impossible, I mean, there are attention deficit disorder students and all of our surrounding schools with the block. We can learn from from them and some of the uh, strategies that they've used. But I'm positive that our, um, engagement, um, structure, uh, support, the fun factor across the board, and kids were reporting how they were doing and how they were paying attention. Those were all from two, two general studies. Just a question, and maybe there's a comment like sitting here too. Um, so Adam, everything that you kind of recited to us, uh, I think it's fantastic that you went through that honest layer of this is kind of where we're at. Uh, the survey that, that we got to see, um, I think you could easily make the, easy make the argument whether you're in favor of block or in favor of current, there's a problem there that it showed. Okay, clearly defined that we have a problem because if you look at it, you can't really pick a side that either is better than the other based off of the survey information. So I'm curious if we were to pause and pretend that block schedule was never a part of the discussion, but take the, the data that you shared take excerpts from the survey and use that to define our current problem. That defined as our current problem, would our solution be block or our solution be just something different or hybrid? Looking at all of the, the information as well as the problem that, that, that you very clearly articulated. Some sometimes and 100% agree with change is good. Not all change is good. Change for the sake of change isn't good, but change drives to continuous improvement. And and sometimes we make change. We find a solution first, and then try to justify or defend the problem that we're trying to solve with the solution. That's kind of why I asked, where, where do you think we would be if, if we had all of that information? We have something more hybrid balance between the two, taking the best of both, or would we still wind up with your recommendation at the block? It's a big question. It's a, it I, is. Yeah, it's, it's a, a big question. It's a good question um, because I think some of the conversation um, that we've had with <laughs> faculty, um, you know, even with parents, I think that we have sort of a modified block right now. Um, although we, I think we could uh, take a look at sort of the why behind certain classes being blocked or not blocked. You know, fair enough. Um, could we try something uh, in some <laughs> department areas? When you look at um, stress management, uh, building college and career readiness skills. So, and that means looking at some of those outcomes that we've identified. Um, reading in particular. Um, what comes forward often when we try to propose changes or have tried to propose changes in the past, I need time. 
that comes forward from faculty at level. Where do we have time for that? I don't, know. I, I don't have time. It's fair. We haven't given you the time. We've given you this structure and, and not necessarily the time to implement those changes. So I think it's an interesting question for us. We don't want to be um, like a doctor diagnosing something wrong, the wrong, you know, it's the wrong disease, wrong, wrong cure. Um, uh, so I think it's a, I think you're asking the right question. I, I feel just off the cuff, like um, the changes we're proposing would, uh, would be the basis or if those instructional and assessment things that we need to see uh, put in place, um, could we do them without a schedule change? I mean, I think I, we've been so dialed in on this. I don't think we've peeled back and looked at that in a while. Certainly could. Um, I don't feel like yeah, I the, the only thing I would add to that is there, there's there's a difference when you commit, right? Uh, when you commit to all of the classes in the same way, then everybody is on the same page, everybody's facing the same challenges, everybody can support each other in the same way because you're experiencing the same thing. Right now, we have such a different structure, and we have different teachers each year who are teaching in those different structures. I find it hard for them to commit to doing our block classes. I think you see that in our, we've had a lot of conversations like, you know, uh, do we need to have some, some do some more work on those classes, right? Because um, it's hard to commit. It's easy when you're a teacher teaching 40 minutes right now to make your block class just do 40 minute classes because um, we don't have the commitment there to do every class or for that teacher to do that every year. I, I think you touched on it earlier. I think one of our most successful classes is a block class. In, what is that class called? The, the grand and the, like, the enriched block. Enriched block. So studies in English. Right? They've committed to it, right? The two of them were very hard to make that class run effectively, uh, and I think um, that's one of our most powerful and impactful classes because of the effort that they put into it. Uh, when you have something as consistent as a schedule change into a navy block, you have every teacher was committing to the same purpose and the same structure. Um, so I think that helps that conversation of, do you know, um, is it is it change for change? Are we looking at the right things? Are we doing the right thing? Because well, I think one of the things that we are struggling with is, is um, commitment to, to um, continue to grow our teaching because we have so many variations to it. And not all pieces are applicable to the other structures. Like she gave the example of the health careers class today. Can't commit to that in 40 minutes, that would be very, very challenging. Yeah, that's it. There's obviously hours of conversation that could be had on that. Or, or, you get a lot of philosophies embedded in that conversation. But I think Sue and I both kind of share our belief that the structure would help. Yeah, so I think it would be it'd be critically important to if we would decide to put it in place for the following year, even next year, that we look at the stats that you provided, the essentially input that is on the screen through the survey, mm -hmm. everything there is telling us we need to change. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily telling us which one is better, it's just saying we need a change. And, and looking through each of those and kind of then setting our it's our goals and what we're looking to achieve out of this change. And then being able to clearly articulate does block get us there. Yeah. Can we answer yes to all of those, yes to 90% of them, and make sure that that structure delivers the change that we are looking for? Yeah, I was, <laughs> I may have been one of the only people happy to see the data that that only 31% of our staff believe what we're doing right now is correct. Because if you remember, I shared with the board, I met with teachers individually, 100 and some teachers, and 78% of them or something shared a concern about the schedule. And I'm sitting here going, but well, we only have 19% and, and you know 46% want to keep the schedule uh, as is, as opposed to changing. So I think there's, uh, you know, there's a lot, if you get, you, know, you can go a lot deeper into that data is what you're pointing at, right? 31% are saying, yeah, we have issues. And I think that's why we took, uh, you know, we, we met with teachers, uh, spent eight hours with 20 plus teachers and tried to question through, you know, we threw eight schedules in front of them, uh, in front of the teachers. And um, and we did try to um, try to kind of press on other options or, or opportunities 
uh, for our schedule. And, and so there has been some of that. I don't, I don't want it to, uh, you know, to, to, to seem like we just said, yeah, UV block seems to be the best for our research. We, you know, we looked at several different schedules with, with the you know, representation from what we hoped was all areas of our school. We did a matrix yeah. at the beginning with that schedule committee, and it was like, here are our whys, here are the things we're after, here are the possible schedules, which one clicks off, which one of these click off our whys most. That's how we arrived at, okay, we we aren't convinced that our schedule can't be, we can't, we can't work within the same schedule. That's what the committee told us. They weren't recommending A, B schedule coming out of committee. They were just saying, okay, this one seems to have the most merit to continue to study and explore. But the committee was still saying, but I still think we, we like aspects of ours. So they weren't going to champion the A day, B day block, even with our faculty. They were just like, yep, worth ex exploring. That's as far as we got on that because it clicked off so many of our whys. And then so much more deep research came as a result of that into the A, B block. So. And something to recognize with the data. That data was received from our teachers prior to some of the solutions that we presented. So our eight, I don't know how many, I know it's nine classes, but we have more than that teachers, right? Probably 20 teachers, there's multiple mm -hmm. teachers who teach those classes. How about that? Yeah, a little bit less. Who are walking into that survey believing they're going to have 3,000 fewer minutes. Um, and so we try to um, keep that thought process. That doesn't mean all of them, now that they have more minutes actually than they started with, are, are okay. supporting a, a block schedule. But but I think those kind of things play a role in it. And, and some of the current concerns that I brought up um, have been remedied and um, you know, post survey. Is it off of what Chris and Amy had suggested already? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just potentially dropping the number of days to days, mm -hmm. considering the resource period. I wonder if we might even consider hybridizing um, even a little bit further. Uh, you know, not being privy to the deep dive in, into the survey results, the data. I'm wondering if there was any suggestion uh, from specific departments or if you, in speaking with your um, many teachers, have heard that there are a number of teachers who would be inclined to at least give us a try. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if we might attempt to um, further some block scheduling with a subset of teachers that have never really done a lot of it before in an effort to gain experience from them. Um, and um, certainly there's persuasion there, but if their experience is good and additive to the blocks that are already being done, perhaps it would have a positive impact on uh, persuading uh, teacher peers uh, and you have a higher favorability. Yeah. So maybe there's a um, possibility for really hybridizing this thing if we would for the upcoming year. I don't know if there's any specific suggestions that came out of the survey. I, you know, I, I, I really dialed in um, at first so much on the faculty survey, and I have to go back and look at that. I spent a lot of time on parents and students, but I feel like, um, I think, although that may not be reflected in the survey data, it certainly was reflected in the department discussion. Um, to to look at different ways of, of thinking about that. We, you know, back back now 20 years ago, more than that maybe, um, like we used to have more options in our schedule beyond what we have. Um, whereas students could say, all right, I want to do social studies nine um, and I want to do it in a block. And then on the opposite end, I'm going to do English as a block. So they would never have English and social studies at the same time. That was a thing here 20 years ago, Mike Breaker, some of you might remember him. He was a golf coach here for like 50 years. Um, so he did that, he loved it, um, and opposite the English. I mean, we used to do more of that, but what happened is the conflicts became so um, so evident that that we had to start to look at scheduling options and maybe said, well, we offer both. Um, you know, what we should have done 20, you know, whenever that, that ended 15 years ago, we should have said, well, which instructional, which schedule supports the instruction best and made that decision, but we didn't, you know, we went back, back with the 40. Um, so there were more options in that regard. Maybe there'd be willing parties to pilot something um, to be able to, to share out with their colleagues. You know, this is this is what it felt like. This is what it looked like. This is what students experienced. These would be the things that we would want to, these were pitfalls that I want to make sure, you know, um, you know, and then 
who are the students that are part of that pilot? Because we want kids to be guinea pigs or anything like that. They'd have to be willing parties uh, involved to try try that too. So we want to be uh, thinking about that. But we we piloted things with some willing willing students for sure in the past. Other innovations. So. Yes, I haven't taken my turn yet to talk. Um, first of all, thank you very much for putting all this together. I know you guys have spent a ton of time. I've been in your office. Answer, you've answered a ton of my questions and everything else, too. Um, I really appreciate the idea of saying, hey, we know we got to probably kind of relook at a few things and make sure everyone else has a few things that are figured out here. Um, your um, little speech here at the end like kind of hit me in the gut of like, Hey, I'm new to the board. I don't know all these facts. Yes, we've got to change something. My daughter will be the first one to say that. Yes, I told her when she told me it's like 42 minutes. I'm like, 42 minutes is too short to learn anything. So something does have to change. Um, but I guess there's a couple things that one, I'd like to understand why the why you guys think those numbers are dropping. Like, is it like due to what other things? Is it like someone said, is it because of lock? Is there other things that are going on in society, other places, other states of why we're dropping like in the US school or some against some of our other schools. Um, because I knew things were different after COVID, but not realizing that it went back seven, eight years of continuous dropping. So I guess I'd like to understand that. And I don't know if that goes to a future curriculum meeting or something that way, but that's long-term numbers, not just since COVID on. So I would love to hear your perspective on that because I know nothing about those numbers. It, it also depends on the the assessment and the score and the rating. Some areas we've gone up and then down. Some we've gone down. So, so it it depends on the the rating scale. And the reason that's important is some of those rating scales are really about, I guess, student achievement that we have influence over. So for instance, advanced placement classes and those tests that remain pretty much the same, it's our teachers, it's our students. So we can look at trends there that might impact our coursework or our instructional strategies. There's other assessments, uh, standardized tests or rating scales, US News and World Report and uh, Washington Post, most challenging high schools. Some of those scales, Arrowhead doesn't even show up on the list because we're not part of a K-12 district. Some of those we're, we've dropped because we don't have as many poor students, <laughs> high poverty numbers. For some districts, if you bring your high poverty students up, you're closing gaps, you're higher on the list. And if we don't have as many high poverty students, we can't show the same growth, and so we're lower on it. So it's always important to know the metrics are all yeah the metrics all the all rating different. scale. So I would think we tend to look at uh, more of the internal. We can't we can't impact how many rich students and poor students are in our school. We don't want to impact that. Yeah, and I mean, I think the um, you know the the report card data is something that we paid attention to. Um, we haven't consecutively dropped in our report card data. We teeter back and forth between significant exceeds and exceeds by a fraction of a percentage uh, that, that separate the two. So you want to be careful when we're looking at that achievement data, not to have knee-jerk reactions that that make us say, you know, the sky is falling. And um, we pay attention and we look at trends. The reading piece yeah. of that has been trend data that we have paid attention to. Um, one of the concerns and as a department, an um, English department has been talking about it, um, Aspire just as a test and, and how that gets conducted in one day, in one battery. Um, do students always see incentive to do well in that assessment? Certainly do for the ACT. Uh, the ACT is a college entrance exam. But Aspire, you know, varying, varying levels. We want them to, you know, arrowhead way, be appropriate, be responsible. Part of, part of what they, we want them to do is always do their best. That's part of our culture. So we have students that definitely do that, but not all students do. So that Aspire value added is part of it is what is the incentive for them? I mean, it does give great information on their college readiness, but for teenagers, sometimes that's not always, um, it's not an excuse, it's just what we've observed. Um, so we have to think about that. Now remember Aspire, 
throughout those eight years, the assessments have changed. We've gone from WKCE to Aspire. Now we're going to pre-ACT. So when the assessments change, uh, that's another kind of factor to consider as well, at least on the report card data and how that gets calculated. Um, so it's not, we don't ignore, we don't chase ratings either. I mean, you know, but Adam's right. They're out. It, it, it's a, it's a, um, it's reflective of outcomes that we want to make sure we're uh, we're thinking about. So it's it, we don't ignore it, um, but I think we're we're, we're definitely uh, studying and wanting to know more about students' attitudes toward those assessments to begin with, and then really because we want to make sure we're looking at accurate data well, about maybe, student performance. Maybe, as a newer board member, that maybe be important to know like which ones are like you're kind of keying in. So then when we do hear certain reports or certain trends like we know are these are the ones that like okay these are more relevant to like knowing academic success versus some other sure so, um, spent in time this case it. and i'm glad you emphasize the reading piece being a uh, outlier you know even given our slight reduction in our report card i think i saw the note that said that we were better than 97 percent of the high schools in wisconsin and so although we've identified a trend that is in our riveted attention here, that doesn't trump the fact that we're doing better than 97% of high schools in Wisconsin. So there is far more benefit to being an airhead student than there is drawback. You know, yeah. I'm very clear about that. Yeah. And maybe just because yes. we're used to being you know, <laughs> top half of 1%, this seems like you know something worth you know, dramatic action. And it is, but still doing it. We don't want to be complacent ever. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think I think it's important not to. I, I think having said that, it's important not to overstate the um, the placements. Um, I, I just pulled it up right now. U.S. News and World Report ranks us in the top three and one third of high schools in the country. Um, you know, we're fifteenth. Yes, we've moved back from four. You know, what can we do to keep moving up the list? Um, it's, it's it's good to know that there are some areas that we need to focus on, um, and I think that's really helpful. Um, I do think when we have, I'm glad that our next meeting is before our next board meeting because I wouldn't feel comfortable voting at the next board meeting to say, "Hey, next year let's implement this." I think that we have to have a more robust discussion about this in general. Um, the, the, the few things, so I wasn't going to share a lot of my notes, but I'm going to share a few of them now, <laughs> um, if it's okay. Um, so, so we've been told kind of that block is generally neutral. There's not like advantages to test scores or disadvantages, right? As far as in general. It's just inconclusive. In inconclusive. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, my, as a single board member, I would not be able to get behind this unless there was a majority of teachers that were for this too. Um, so I, obviously that would take some work to where we are now. Um, I, I think there's there's also some thoughts to consider potential unintended consequences. And again, this is just anecdotal and it's one story. However, um, when my girls were pre-K, Oconomowoc decided to go to Black. As a result, people fled Oconomowoc. Well, they also cut staff as part of yeah, that was, plan. Yeah, it was yeah. multiple. It was multiple. Yes, yeah. that's one of the reasons that we moved to this area, um, and also knowing that the kids are going to Arrowhead. Of course, this year my my girls will be done, but um, you know I I also have the same passion for as you guys do for all all students that are still coming. So I'm not. I, I definitely think that's that's important to know. Um, Let's see, a few other things. Um, I think the, I think there is, right now, there seems to be a balance with block and 40 minute um, that might be able to be tweaked, you know, as, we, as we're talking through the night. And obviously that should be a, a, ta a target topic for our next uh, meeting, um, especially within the, the English and, and, and reading areas. Um, but uh, my, I'm kind of curious. It's kind of interesting because, you know, statistics can you can kind of twist and 
make statistics seem any way you want them to, um, as we see in media all the time. I don't think any of these are twisted. I'm not saying that. But I find I found it interesting that 16% uh, of our teachers prefer block, and 14% of our current teachers already do only block. So that's, I think, something that's a little bit noteworthy. Um, and then, let's see. So I, I, I still, I do have concerns for continuity um, between some of the subjects. Um, and I know that uh, one of the big uh, uh, thoughts that uh, you shared, Adam, that are, that's a good one, is that there'll be time saved between classes, you know, um, not switching classes so much. Uh, I think that's a positive. However, um, and I, again, this is just anecdotal, uh, but several of the teachers that I spoke with that were out on the 27th mentioned that because the classes are now so long, the last third of the class basically becomes a study hall. So again, there, there's lost time that I think we're not really looking at or talking about or money for. And I know that there would be, I'm not stating that in a sense that there wouldn't be um, learnings that you would bring to the teachers to help them to understand how to approach this. But I do think, I mean, 84 minutes, I, there's very few of my college classes uh, I also pulled up what's the average length of a college class, and it says 50 minutes, you know, or yeah, yeah. 50, 60. Yeah. But I, I do think that there is going to be, um, Craig brought up, uh, I thought, a good point as well uh, in, with regards to pacing. Um, and this was something that I heard from one of the teachers I spoke with as well. And that, okay, if you have a math class currently, that's 40 minutes every day. Um, versus a math class that's 80 minutes every other day, you're not going to, you know, there is, there's some urgency to a 40 minute class as you obviously know. And there, there won't be to an 80 minute, which is also part of the reason that you're looking at it. Um, however, having said that, there's no way that the content of the 40 minute classes is going to be extrapolated into 80 minute classes unless the same urgency is there. So there is going to be content loss. And there are some teachers that I've talked to uh, that have taught in both situations that have brought that to my attention, um, stating that, that that's a big concern. Um, so I, I think there's, and having said all that, obviously there's no concrete data that says one is necessarily better than the other. So with all those concerns and all those thoughts in my head, I think, okay, Right now, we have kind of a hybrid. It's not perfect. There, there are things that we should work on with it. Um, but is this the right answer? Is this, it, do I, as one individual, feel like this is addressing all the things that we need to address? And, uh, you know, for me, it's, it, it, I don't think it is at this point. Um, having said that, like I said earlier, I think the resource period is a very strong positive. Um, but I think that there's uh, some other things that we should talk about more um, with regards to some of those other thoughts. Is, I know Brandon's on the. I couldn't tell if he is or not. I I can't see that part. <laughs> Brandon, do you have anything? It looks just like it's a computer. I see the. Yeah, I see space. Purpose. Is the volume not working on the computer? Is he trying to talk? I don't know. I saw his icon like flashing. Yeah, so I flash. Flash. So usually that indicates there's something there. Hold on, Brandon. We're working on it. Wait the next one. Does that do anything? Okay, yes, I can hear you now. It's the volume for both. I, I mean, I can hear you, but it's the microphone. Can you put them on the right? There we go. I have no idea. Right now, Brandon. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
mean, I'm really pretty torn on the issue, to be honest. I mean, I, I can see um, both sides of this at this point, and I think there's a lot of public position has to be in favor of the public, which includes a constituent to this point. But the case that you guys make is very, very compelling, and uh, to be honest, I do feel like we need to make a change. Um, I'm curious as to what what is it? What decision is it that the board is going to need to make? Is it a decision that we implement this next year, or is it a decision that we implement in two years and put a plan in place to make sure we execute it properly? Uh, in those, you know, the time leading up to the two-year implementation. I guess what I'm trying to understand is what what it is the administration at this point would like the board to act on, and from there I can help. You know, I, I feel like I can formulate a better opinion and plan towards you know whatever it is you guys recommend at this point. So what what are the next steps in your guys' mind and opinion right now? Well I think I mean our recommendation initially coming into this can you hear me, Brandon? Yeah, for oh okay. Um our recommendation at this point is recognizing we've got some continued um learning and conversations uh, with all the stakeholders, uh, we wanted to have this conversation, like depth, in depth conversation with the board now, um, so that we knew going into next year would be tight. Um, we knew that when we talked about bringing this conversation here in November to fruition, um, you know, we administratively got to a place where we know we've got we've got work to do. Uh, we can revise our recommendation, you know, in light of we'd want to have some conversation to decide if that's. Um, feasible ahead of a, a board meeting. Um, but right now, the recommendation on the table is to um, have a vote in December. And based on the recommendation, right now, the vote would be um, a, B, a B block of the resource period in 24-25. Um, we can revise that if that's the direction the board wants to consider. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that might make sense based on where where the team thinks we are, and I think the fact that you guys have, um, you know, understood the feedback, taken the feedback to heart, and I think we all, I mean, maybe we all can't agree, but I, I, I tend to lean towards this being a positive thing in the long run. I think it'll be bumpy at first, and all change is bumpy. I've experienced that organization myself, but you know, we're we're also stewards of the long term vision as board members, and. You know, this just feels to me like the right thing to do in terms of how it preparedness and and above and beyond high school. So that my biggest concern going into this my public and staff was not ready to implement this based on um, the plan or you know the plan to train them to get up to speed. I just don't think we have that the amount of time to do that at this point for to implement this next year. But if we put up some plan in place to get Staff up to speed from a training standpoint. I mean, we really need to focus in on the organizational design, you know, the, the teaching design versus the content to make sure that content is, is presented properly in this, this longer period. And, you know, I kind of agree with Laura's previous comment that this will help us, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say weed out, that's the wrong term, but we'll, we'll really understand which teachers are going to be on board with this and can help lead us to the future. With this, and you know, the ones that are going to grasp it and take the next step in terms of leading others. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want it to go missed or, or unsaid, just to remind us that um, a few years ago we left school on a Friday and knew we were going to have a meeting on a Monday. And that meeting on a Monday, we flipped our entire model for how we were going to teach and deliver our curriculum to kids, and we started it on a COVID push us to that. Nobody thought it was even remotely the right way to teach kids. We knew that face-to-face -face instruction was the best way, but it was something we had to do. Mm -hmm. We came together. We did it in one day. It took other schools, I think, the best I don't think anybody turned it around in one day. I think other schools took three days, took weeks, some took two weeks, some tried to write it out for a little while just to see what we'd be back in person. 
but never got there. I met with colleagues from around the county on a weekly basis. And I have to say that our staff was implementing virtual learning during the quarantine period better than any other school. Some of the stories I heard from other schools, I was like, that's not happening here. We've got a, as best of a handle on it as we possibly can. I think we made um, a sh an insurmountable shift. I think we did it really well. We came together and we did it because there was the edict that we needed to do it. And we did it on Monday and Tuesday we started. Um, we came back the next year to figure out how we were gonna keep school open um in masks half our or not half our students but like a third of our students virtual learning with quarantines taking kids out of our classroom every single it was awful <laughs> we kept school open somehow for an entire school year because our staff figured it out because we needed to do it and that's all we knew we needed to do was that we needed to keep school open for our kids and sometimes it was with duct tape and scotch tape at some points so when we didn't have duct tape but we were able to do it. When this staff is able to get, or when the staff is, is, is in a position to change and, and, and needs to change, they can do it and they can do it at a high level. And so I think that the longer implementation period to go into 24, 25 gives us a chance to um, ramp up and change and make the needed changes that we, that, that would be necessary to teach in a block. And I think a statement that would say we're going to do it in 24-25 gives us that needed pressure to make sure that the change is done and done well. But I know we can do it because we've done it before in worse situations. Thank you. I agree. Um, I still like the idea of the year going to the eight period day with the lunch every close period. It's kind of like a soften the blow type of thing. And uh, the resource period to me seems very necessary, especially in light of the DCI report. The reading. And then after that, 2024, 2025, what is that? So, go ahead. So, no, no, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that if the recommendation is the board, the board to uh, take action on a proposed uh, 24 to 25 implementation. If you could uh, flesh out some of those things that would be implemented during this upcoming year prior to, to ensure that we are further along the curve uh, so that the board is very reassured and that we're heading in the right direction, and, uh, perhaps impacting some of the survey numbers and uh, bringing people along the curve. All stakeholders. Um, I think that would go a long way uh, towards uh, having people formulate uh, a well informed opinion. An additional comment, and Adam, you were kind of speaking to an earlier point to both of those cases where the administrator, bad Adam, bad, bad Adam. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, in both of those cases, the administration and the staff had a clearly defined problem. Like that's what we had to do. We, my opinion, speaking for me, I don't think we have that clearly defined problem. We've articulated one, but again, it, it's almost like we're we're fitting a problem to a solution. So, in, in, for me to get there, um, I want to make sure that we have an answer to the problem specifics that we're trying to solve and then put kind of performance measures in place leading up to the point of implementation as well as beyond implementation. Are we delivering on those? Are we, from an administration standpoint, and staff standpoint, are we being accountable to what we committed to the students and, and faculty and community that we're intending to achieve? as well as we should be accountable as well uh, that we are achieving those and if not we adapt accordingly so i really need to kind of see that framework before before i can get to a, a support it's not that i don't support the chain we absolutely need something it, it's obvious to me but i want to make sure it's the, the right one and very informed so are we looking at like two separate votes of the implementation of the resource period, possibly into next school year, and then a second vote for? Uh, 
the so implementation of AV. Yeah, and do we need to discuss this further at the next I, curriculum yeah. meeting on the 8th? Yeah. Because it is one of those things that, you know, a continuation of the conversation. I know we talk about the teachers, but, you know, I still have a few questions out there, you know, with the teachers, but also the students making the transition. And if we have that continuation of the conversation, which I think is great, I think it's necessary. Um, and if we were to do a hybrid kind of step by step for next year, leading to the following year, how um, difficult or practical is that to do, do it that way? Is that an easier way to do it step by step, or is it more difficult to, to do it that way? I think if we if we confirm that we're meeting on the 8th or whatever date, then that gives us some time to kind of flesh that out. <clears throat> so if it was going to be, we go from a nine period day plus lunch down to an eight period day plus lunch and a resource period. What are, so we can come back to say to you, here's the pros, here's the cons, here's the, the challenges in making that work for next year. Um, and here's the benefits. I mean, just off the top of my head, and we haven't been talking about it, but it could be one change next year. Let's get good about resource period. <clears throat> Let's use the rest of this year. Really good about resource period. Put that into place. And it's not as much of a change. So it's incremental. Let's be excellent with resource period and all next school year will be excellent with instructional strategies for a longer period. Maybe that's the right way to do it. On the other hand, it could be the opposite. It could be one change and then another change and another change. And, and maybe that's overwhelming. I don't feel like I know enough about that to say right now, great idea incremental or yikes, that just adds more change and stress and learning that we can't do that. I, I don't know. We, we have to. I think if, if that's that. the kind of where we're at in the discussion, I think we can circle back, flush some things out, have some conversations, get some some feel for folks. And, and if there seems to be anecdotally, I don't think we're going to resurvey, uh, but at least on the faculty side of things, if people kind of go, I, I think I can handle that, that would move me along that continuum toward, toward agreement. I mean, we can share that, um, find a way to share that with you. But we'd have to flush it out for them and then and then come back at that discussion on the eight. I want to remind you of the Kansas situation. Yeah. It takes time. You know, and that that's that's I, I have to contemplate that because I feel like resource period to do it well. Every school we talk to, you get started, it kind of goes looks along, you you evaluate, you make some improvements. Are we giving enough time to that in that model? Uh, before we're also then layering on, given we're proposing <laughs> uh, a big change all at once. So I, I I recognize the contradiction there, but it's something to think about. But it is kind of better to slowly easing into it than all of a sudden, okay, we're going to be flat, you yeah. know, I, I think. Yeah. And, and there's probably different schools of thought. There's mm -hmm. change can be uh, more impactful with the opportunity for that that real rooted continuous improvement if you do the rip the bandit approach mm -hmm. and versus a slow roll even with the slow roll you'll have people that don't necessarily support it keep latching on to the old old way in the event to try to influence to go backwards so it's we have yeah we have a process there's multiple ways and yeah. and and no crystal ball. That's, that's, yeah. yeah, that's a good point because I'm just I'm just now processing, right? And I'm thinking a resource period and an alternating day block supports a student because they only have three or four teachers, really, three or four classes each day, right? When you add it to an eight period day, now that resource period, how many teachers are they trying to meet with in 30 minutes? Is it seven or eight, or is it three or four, or is it one? So I don't, I would I can't even play that out in my head yet. Um, you can follow up with that, some other schools right. too yes. yeah. who have that scenario. Yeah. So I was wondering if in your visitation a couple of weeks back or in your experience, uh, um, was it done one way or the other? Yeah, the two schools. So for those schools, Lutzenberg Casco was ripped the band-aid and Cedarburg the year prior was ripped the band-aid. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. those resource with the block is going to change. Yeah. 
I guess my my one concern, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the resource period as a concept, but if we're implementing it without the uh, AB block scheduling, then we're not picking up the time savings from the AB block scheduling to sort of pay for the time that we're putting in the schedule for the resource period. Right. And so we very well might be a situation where we're putting the kids in front of teachers less yeah. minutes out of the week than we were. Well, they all, we are now. all have, a, have a study hall now. I mean, virtually all. Right. Right, because didn't you say like so, about ninety nine percent? That would everybody be, has at least one, yeah, yeah. and more than half. Uh, so that would just half. be like the study hall. Yeah. I mean, I guess the AB block it wasn't the study hall, so I was assuming that it was an extra period. And I was <laughs> Maybe what we're saying here is maybe you can explore this as a as a discussion point. Is there a synergy between the the uh, the block and the resource period? Are, are they not only Necessarily together or best together. But yeah, I mean, there's a way to maintain the minutes per day or minutes per week and get a resource period in there. Obviously, if you sold us on that, it sounds <laughs> like, like your neighbor who doesn't think that's a good idea. Did I get one? I, I agree uh, with Mr. Evers too, with regards to uh, you know uh, looking at this. Um, I I wouldn't personally feel comfortable voting on a 23-24 implementation in December. I like kind of what you were talking about, Sue, and what you were talking about, and let's let's do this. Let's do this this uh, resource period, and then re look at it again next year. Um, I wouldn't feel comfortable making both decisions, and that's just me. Maybe everybody else does, um, but I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying, "Okay, yep, let's let's do the resource and let's absolutely go into 23 and 24 and do the uh, AB block." That's uh, no, we did 24, 25. Or 24, 25. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. So. And yet, I, I see the need to give staff, you know. A clear statement, and that's what they've got to get ready for. Well, right. the absence right. of that statement, they yep. don't get ready. Yep. I'd also be curious, and I know it's probably difficult to do, but um, with anyone that will watch the watch the video or anyone in the audience that came into the tonight's meeting against going to block, if there's things within the meeting tonight that is what's your opinion in favor of, or at least in favor of not staying what we have, but going to something different? Because some of the feedback was very much against that I have seen. But, and personally, I, I uh, taking all of that feedback in, I came into the meeting against it, but it wasn't until the survey data, which isn't in favor of going to block, it's just in favor of changes, and then your your comments that really put me into all right. I can I can now see the benefit, but is it the right? Is it still the right? So I'd, I'd really encourage the, the public to to think about that. The parents and, and faculty and, and students is something now switch based off of this conversation that if you would lean the other way. And I would say Sue and Adam can share some stories of that with parents or students that came in. To argue and walked away saying, "Oh, didn't didn't understand. Now I get it." And so they've had that experience, but it's it's, it's been one so on one conversation, yeah. um, and where you learn in depth and you can have that. Or there's someone we don't recognize as a citizen. I, for some of you who don't know me, most of you, I taught in Elmbrook schools for the last thirty five years and went through the transition to block. And it was ripped the Band-Aid off. It's a different, it's a four by four. Um, I have a perception from that of, and ideas coming into this that I probably can't erase because I've lived it. So it's a different perspective. The one thing I'm taking away though, especially as an educator, we have issues. 
what we should be focusing on is what's the root cause of those? I don't think a schedule is the root cause. I think we really have to seriously look at our reading. I know that you explored a reading specialist because one of my closest friends interviewed for it and you made it a part-time. If you're gonna commit to something as a board and our reading is a real issue, it's an issue everywhere. I'm gonna tell you that as a board. It's not Arrowhead. It's all over. About 10 years ago, they got rid of reading as a mandatory course at middle school level. And nationwide, we've seen sport go down from there. Besides that, if you're going to make a commitment to something like that, you got to go full time. You've got to have somebody in here who's an expert, who's going to commit the time to those kids who really need that help. On the flip side, many times districts look at the bottom and they want to solve those problems but keep in mind our top kids you don't want them stagnant either mm -hmm. so it's a balancing act but i i do have to say we got to find the root cause this is an exceptional school district and i know it's one that brookfield compares to constantly the other thought i had looking at whitefish bay they always stick to somewhat traditional methods. Would you agree after being there? I know their math curriculum, they always kind of kept it sort of traditional when things were going a little different. They seem to have a traditional schedule. I'm I'm just yeah. going from observation. I would say instructional strategies are, are not old fashioned. It's not. No, not old fashioned. fashioned. It's just those lecture. Different. My thought was, why are we looking at what they're doing? They have been number one as long as I can remember. I was depart I, department chair in Elbrook for 20 years. I looked at those scores every year, analyzed them. They have been number one as long as I can remember. What are they doing? They've got a really diverse population. I mean, actually, they do not have <laughs> Well, they are a lot more diverse than we do. As far as they've got some low low kids that come from different communities. I mean, it's not just Whitefish Bay. No, but the Chapter 220 program's been weeding out. Right, but they do have a choice. Um, kids can they, choose to go there. They do not take open enrollment. It's only Chapter 220. And while those students are um, exiting, they're, and not that it matters, they're just they're not as yeah. diverse. And they're Property rate is under five percent, maybe two and a half percent. One point one percent. I thought they still had one point one point one percent. Okay, I thought they still yeah. had some choice school kids coming into their district, but I may be mistaken. Regardless, I think they're a similar population, and they might have some good things for us to learn from. Yeah, they're doing something, and they have been for a long time. So what is our staffing for reading interventionist here at Arrowhead? Do we know? Or I didn't know if you knew or yeah, so we have our uh, special education teachers run uh, reading interventions uh, throughout the day. And then we also have a reading interventionist who's uh, staff uh, part time to fill in with the special education teachers uh, can't make it to. We have a contract with PISA uh, for a reading specialist who comes out um, on average uh, twice a month to start the school year. And then that um, will go down about uh, uh, once a month here in the upcoming month. Um, and then we can take days and bring her back in towards the end of the school year when we're ramping up for professional development. Having a reading specialist has been uh, key to us. Um, bringing our getting that contract with seems over the last two years it's, it's been a huge benefit to us uh, she helped us uh, our, our special education teachers are great in that they <clears throat> looked at what they were doing in the classroom and they said we we understand that um, we don't know everything that we should probably know about reading uh, they worked with the reading specialist this past summer to revamp our uh, reading intervention courses provide uh, more direct instruction with the strategies that they were providing we changed our diagnostic tool from SAR reading to I-Ready. 
iReady has a more user-friendly uh, platform in terms of diagnosing specific problems with reading that we're seeing with our students and linking that information into the teaching strategy. So we've worked to link that data into what we do within the classroom. I think that there are some um, uh, ripe areas that we can look at in terms of uh, the way that we present reading in, in the classroom, the way that we teach reading in the classroom, the focus on it, um, uh, make things better for, for all students. We know from our diagnostic that we gave this year that we cannot rely on reading intervention for all students that fall below benchmark because we would spend uh, an infinite amount of money trying to do that, right? So a reading, inter, uh, reading specialist will cost us uh, a total package of somewhere in the ballpark of 80 to 100,000, if not more with, with insurance. Um, right now, a reading specialist from CISA is around uh, $12,000, something like that. So when you talk about the, you know, the cost and disparity, that's kind of what you're looking at right now. Our reading interventionist is around uh, 30 grand, something in that ballpark um, to have them on. So it, it would be a shift that, you know, bringing more people on for a higher cost is, is, is going to be a good thing. Like it's going to be a, a, a beneficial thing, um, but it's just a resources thing that we've always, we're not big against and I'm looking at what we need to do. Um, I guess the other part, and uh, Kim or Amy, one of you made the, the comment about the shift, and I think it was Kim, uh, not losing reading if we're looking at making a shift to a schedule change, right? Not, not losing that focus. I believe um, we need to make some changes in the, in the way that we look at reading uh, across um, Courses, not just in the English department, but the whole school piece. And we've had a lot of talking, a lot of talks about this within our, our, our program leader meeting. Um, one way that helps facilitate that, if you're looking at changing instruction, is with you're having to change instruction anyways, because you're going to a, uh, a, a block model. So um, it, it can be a catalyst, just change anyways. You're having to do it. Anyways, because you're changing to a block model and look at all the other pieces. You can do it without it, right? Um, but again, it, like, it could be a catalyst. So that's our reading staffing for reading um, intervention, right? So that is when we notice that there's reading problems with students, and we're talking those within the bottom uh, 25th percentile, that uh, uh, we jump in and, and, and we do something about it. Parents have to agree to it as well because it is a scheduling piece that they have to consider that um, it, it, it does take away like an elective class option from uh, their students. So we get some opt outs in there as well. Uh, another piece of data that we talk about, um, and uh, Jean was alluding to this, but I have to disagree with what she said about uh, neglecting the top tier um, students. I don't think that we, uh, and I'm not saying that you said that, oh, we, I just, that, that, that we didn't neglect them. However, um, in, in, in looking at data from um, the time I started here, 2011-2012, uh, we had a program called Achieve, and I would measure the progress of a student in our reading intervention against all other students within the school on this program called Achieve 2000. Uh, Achieve 2000 also gave us national data. So I could look at our students within interventions, and they would all improve. All right, there's all show improvement throughout, easy one to hit. Um, around 60 to 70 percent of them would outpace the national average on reading scores. So they would, they would, they would, they would, their, their pace would be above the pace of um, everybody else in the nation that was on the Achieve 3000 platform. So we could outpace the nation. We could not even come close to catching Arrowhead students' pace and rate. So what I took away from that data is that there's something in the way um, that we're calibrated in our courses, and especially our, our generalized courses that all uh, students take, that really benefits the mid to high tier students. But the, the students that don't read so well, they get left behind. Like th That was where that gap was. And I think that that is something that we're looking at currently uh, with 
and our program leads is what can we do for those that aren't um, coming along with us um, when they were having a fun. So, Adam, I remember Ray Foster used to volunteer as a reading uh, tutor system. He's an old, you know, retired CEO in the like education and did it for many years. Do we still have members of the public who come in and volunteer for that sort of duty? We do not. Um, where we found the biggest gains is through the um, direct instruction with the reading. Mm -hmm. um, the reading interventions, they they work. Um, the students do better. I'm anxious to see if we're going to take our mid-year uh, assessment for our students' reading intervention coming up here in December, January to see where they, they've come by. Again, the uh, addition of a, of a reading specialist and just being able to consult with her has been huge. Um, for us, but again, there's a lot more talk and discussion to um, to happen around this. Our, our department chairs, and as Adam said, the bureaucracy the department chairs, uh, hot on the hot on the trail with um, really breaking down the data from from I ready to look at specifics of, of, of where we might be able to make some difference. Yeah. 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 piggyback off of what he's saying, um, I think the system that we have, we've been we went from achieving. We went to STAR, now we're in a program right now it's about identifying the kids and identifying them as, as quickly as we can, especially our incoming ninth graders, because I feel like right now at this pace that we have, it's got to be faster. we got to find a system so that we can pair that up with the teachers and the parents so that we can work with them as we're going through you know, the course of the year. And then the next step is, and you know, I I also agree we we need to get training that's necessary to intervene and work with these kids. Um, English doesn't have all the answers, but we're certainly going to do our, our best to work with these kids that are struggling in reading. But I do feel like we have to have a structure in place that we can meet their needs, and it means bringing in somebody like this reading specialist right now. She. She's been very helpful, and I think our focus is working with these kids that are struggling and building that system and making it stronger. So, you know, I also, you know, I, when I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about, you know, <clears throat> we talk about the resource period and block and all the other stuff, I'm, I'm not opposed to block in one way or the other. I think we could be in English all this time you know, and, and speak on other coursework, but I do think. When we're looking at our state schools, the PPI schools, I think there's, you know, we talk at a little time, but um, I don't think if we just do just a resource period, that's not the answer for bringing those schools. So I just try just throwing that out there as if that's a if that's something that's a a factor. I don't believe that. One, one thing I'd like to not to derail us further, but the reading topic is, is very, uh, I think we need to have that even deeper. And so maybe we could, we could have that as a, as a future item in the curriculum. I, I'd actually like to think about our approach to this maybe slightly different and not to suggest that we already, we already are. So I think we may have a, another way to collaborate even deeper with our leaders. And and go after a shared reading specialist because really our feeder schools are our suppliers of students. And if our supplier of students isn't meeting our expectation for our end goal, we, we've got to boost them to provide us what we what we need coming in so that we can push them up the rest of the way. So I think we're gonna have some proposing out loud and um, Figure out a way that we can collaborate with them and bring them into the discussion and uh, have a shared solution across the board, which I know we're challenged. I, I agree that's... completely. And I, you know, I, it kind of begs the question I'm sure there has been because these results are so new. I get the complete autopsy, if you will, on where we're at and what all the data suggests. But, and again, not in an effort to pass the buck in any way. Uh, we're all part of the unified school district. 
Um, but it, it does lead one to wonder, uh, what are the reading rates looking like? What are the proficiency numbers from our feeder schools? And uh, it, 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 things need to be dropped down and really a little more hand-holding needs to be done with our feeder schools. I couldn't agree more with you tonight. It's, it's some type of collaborative um, uh, intervention between uh, Arrowhead and our feeder schools really might be more yeah. order. I, I would encourage you when you look at the report card because it's, it's pretty short, it's three or four pages, and it's pretty evident on this that the value added chart on there is the part that is most troubling. And value added measurement is based on what you start with yeah. and what you push out of the door. So if you start with really low level kids and you get them up to average, you're doing great, right? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe our challenge is, is that we get really smart kids <laughs> and we can't make them that much smarter than you know a lower starting student can be raised in the system. I'm not sure if that is a legitimate analysis or not, but it, but it seems like that measurement is intended to measure what happens in house, not what we start with. Well, and I know Sue that you've mentioned that uh, your the teachers for the freshman teachers know uh, where certain kids are coming from just by their abilities. You know, so there's obviously best practices in some of the feeder schools that are working, um, and and maybe that's I. I you know, it's going to be that. I mean, that's a tough discussion, and I know that you guys have had it already. But uh, it's a discussion that I think we need to continue to have, uh, and it's it's really for the best uh, the best possible outcomes for all. But I know that there's every school has their own identity and wants to be able to control their own abilities with their teachers and their kids. But I think that that's a that's a big deal, um, and I don't want to overstate like. The ratings, the you know, moving from four to fifteen, or understated. Um, but the there's there's one thing that I know that uh, Laura that you brought up too as well uh, with regards to um, with regards to open enrollment. You know that affects our schools, and so it'd be interesting to see what our open enrollment has looked like over the last seven years. Has that gone up and our scores have gone down? Um, something else to just also be concerned with with regards to that uh, and there were several parents that spoke with me and we and as we all know we live in an area of means that have said if we go to black we're going to private school you know so then it continues to exacerbate that and it's not i don't think i don't know if that was meant as a threat but like you know if this president gets elected i'm moving to canada or if that's if that's if there's some legitimacy to that, you know. But those are things that I think, as a as a board and as a school, we really need to wrap our heads around. And that's why I don't think this is something that uh, obviously I appreciate you, you, the point of view that you're both coming to tonight. Where hey, we need more time. We need to we need to think about this deeper because it is complex. Well, given that we spent three and a half hours on this, <laughs> and I was kind of call it at nine o'clock, but get going so um for the next meeting on the eighth should we just need discussion on this block that again and continue it is that okay with that mm -hmm. and just that we're aware the december 8th meeting will also need to have the course guide review for the 23 24 school year because in order for us to have that ready for the web to publish and be ready for a feeder school transition to the high school we need to have the board uh, review that and approve it so that has to be on December 8th so that it can be approved uh, if there are any adjustments and then approved at the board meeting on the 14th. That also has to be part of the discussion. How long does that take you? Well, it depends how many questions you have. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you'll have that ahead of time. I'll have highlighted all the changes. Um, so that, that, that'll help probably reduce that. We don't have a whole bunch of changes. So that helps, yeah. um, should be somewhat shorter. And the other pieces Kim mentioned, bringing back um, Honors English 10, and I guess some of the Honors English 9 book discussion as well. Um, we, so there's a lot on the plate to consider there if we wanna wanna do that as well. That, well, that we could go to the January meeting, yeah, but we need- Supporting out the black and the yeah, course guide review. Okay. Yeah. Well, one thing to consider is for Carol, um, and the uh, of, of the teachers who've been working on that team to 
continue to be ready for the implementation of honors. We don't want to delay that too long. We want to make sure she's got good direction from all of us and uh, working to uh, well, build up. Be in January. It's a half, I think it's early half January. Yeah, maybe we could try to do that right after the break. Or... Yeah. Can we bring, it, would it make it easier if we could just say that we're going to, you know, in that meeting, bring that course to the December meeting for approval and then, you know, ending, or is that where we already are? That's where you're, we are. You're, 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 you just want it, it's more of a, just a review or discussion probably okay. Right. Okay. about, about um, content in the, um, yeah. the, the proposed texts. Yeah. I know there was some discussion of honors already. For the ninth grade, but I do think the tenth grade one is going to be the priority right now because we got to get going on that. Okay, so those two things for next meeting, watch and the fourth grade. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So then we have other future agenda items that will come up later. Our next meeting is December eighth, and anything else before I adjourn? Okay, we're adjourned. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.